Mm -hmm. Well, hello, Mr. Kermy. How are you today? Good. Good. Okay, I'm ready. Well, it's not time yet. Yeah, it's 7 o'clock. Okay, the Charter Township of Plymouth regular a Board of Trustees regular meeting for Tuesday, September 13th, 2022 will come to order. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Trustee Stewart. Here. Trustee Monahan. Here. Trustee Kermy. Here. Trustee Buckley. Here. Clerk Vorba. Here. Treasurer Dorshevitz. Here. Supervisor Heisey. Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Pledge of Allegiance. How about Steve Mann tonight? <laughs> you remember the words? <laughs> we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Approval of the agenda, item C. Mr. Supervisor. Mr. Clerk. I move the approval of the agenda for Tuesday, September 13, 2022. Motions made by Clerk Vorba. Is there a second? Okay. Second by Trustee Monahan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, item D is approval of the consent agenda. Comments, questions? Yeah, Mr. Supervisor, yes, just sir. wanted to, for the minutes, just add a, uh, a one sentence line from Ms. Broderick to the uh, comments for that. With that, I would move for the approval of the consent agenda for Tuesday, September 13, 2022. Okay, motions made by Clerk Vorba. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Monahan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Very good. Item E is public comment, limited to three minutes. This is not your only opportunity during the meeting that we'll also have comments on individual <coughs> agenda items. All we ask is that you limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody at this time? Okay. We're going to move on to item F1. This is the Plymouth Walk PUD consideration. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Planner Laura Haw. Thank you. Good evening, trustees. Good evening. Yeah, Trustee Dershowitz, if you could please go to the beginning. Um, this is just a, a highlight of the Plymouth Walk residential planned unit development project um, and some of the changes that have been made since you last saw um, this development proposal. So the project is for 369 residential units between townhouses and um, that are condos and um, three-story apartments. Um, looking at the timeline, so this is the correct slide, um, this project started actually informally over a year ago and the first meeting was um, with the Planning Commission in October of last year where a public hearing was held. Um, following that meeting in January, the Planning Commission then discussed the PUD option and made a recommendation of approval to the board. Uh, the, this board then discussed the project in April um, and later on in April at a second meeting granted approval of the PUD option. So that was really the eligibility and allowed the develop, uh, developer to further refine the plans and um, make adjustments based on your feedback. So that was the first phase of the development. Then the next slide shows the actual PUD development plan. So this is more the site plan. This is the fine tuning of the site and incorporating those changes that this board requested. So in July, the Planning Commission reviewed the tentative um, development plan and gave feedback and direction to the applicant. They made changes and came back in August where the Planning Commission unanimously approved the final uh, PUD development plan and they recommended that to be considered by the Board of Trustees and the PUD contract as that is um, this body is the one that enters into agreement uh, with the developer for the PUD contract. So here we are tonight um, with the contract in front of you and the final development plan is an exhibit to that contract. Um, moving forward after tonight um, pending approval, the developer would work with the township for final engineering on building permits, um, any um, related requests for a brownfield or, or with the DDA, those would all happen in the future. So some of the main changes, um, since you last saw this plan in um, April, include traffic calming measures. So several um, Pinch points have been added along that main spine road in the development. That's the north to south road that connects up to um, Fairwood. You can see the pinch point there. It's highlighted 
Um, it's a narrowing of the road in order to uh, slow traffic. Um, all the pinch points also have um, crosswalks that are um, illuminated. Um, Four-way stops have also been added, so traffic will be stopping throughout this development. It's not just a single um, cut through. Um, five additional crosswalks themselves have been added along the spine road, um, which again calls attention that pedestrians could be crossing. There's um, street trees in those areas as well as lighting. So that helps to reduce traffic. So throughout the spine road, there's nine different crossings now, which is quite a lot. Um, and then as far as parking, the surface parking has been reduced uh, by 14 spaces, um, and uh, that was replaced with green space. So the, the open areas um, have been increased slightly uh, throughout the parking lot. Why did you reduce it by 14? Those were the spots that we identified that um, would be best for safety, for traffic, or uh, ideal for additional green space. You have adequate parking? Yes. The site is overparked still. Um, the next slide uh, shows some of the pedestrian amenities that were added. In total, 34 crosswalks were added. Um, um, additional pathways were created throughout the development. This just highlights a couple of the main ones. Um, and they have been varied um, to create some more interest for those actually using them for walking, jogging, etc. cetera. Um, benches have been placed throughout the development at strategic locations. The pathways and intersections are lighted. If you go to the next slide, um, there is decorative street lighting um, throughout the development. There's also what's shown here on the left, top left image. These are bollards, uh, bollard lighting um, at some more of the pedestrian areas, so it's a little bit softer um, and more to scale. Is that solar? Um, no, these are um, LED. And then um, on the townhouses themselves are decorative coach lights that will kind of add to the, the lighting of the, um, the street. So what, <clears throat> what is being done to keep in the spirit of uh, dark sky? Um, the, there's lights now that are approved, and so reducing the emissions of light, what is being done? Tell me about... So, you know, sometimes lights that are mounted high on a building carry quite a ways. Yes, so. that's, a, that's a great point. The lighting that is proposed in this development is pedestrian in scale. I don't think any of the lighting is greater than uh, 16 feet in height, um, which, you know, as comparison, if you go to Henry Ford, I think the lighting there is 22. Um, so these will all be lights that are lower to the ground. The bollards themselves, I think, are no greater than... Um, four feet, and then the building mounted lighting is near the garage, like the garage, so eight feet, nine feet. Um, overall, the lighting levels on the site are way under what's required by ordinance, or the, the maximum that you can um, go up to under ordinance. So it's definitely a, a less intensive um, site when it comes to illumination. Um, they've provided covered bicycle parking within the carports now um, at different locations throughout the site, so those will be available to residents. And they've also increased the landscaping on the site overall and provided some additional screening. So you can see this is the northern berm. Uh, Firwood is just to the north there. And they've increased this berm height to eight feet. They're also proposing a conservation easement um, to the north. They provided over 100 uh, additional trees uh, for some additional um, softening of the site. Laura, do you have any example, do you have a graphic of what the conservation easement looks like? I mean, this, this is great, but there's, the conservation easement is actually to the, to the east of this. Would, can you, do you have anything that would illustrate that? Um, on, the, on the plan set, yes, if Trustee Dershevitz, if you have the, the full plan set, if you wanted to open that up. We could zoom into that. And then the, the following slide um, that was going to be up uh, is a table that details when this body first reviewed the project in April. 
the amount of trees that were proposed to be saved, including the amount of heritage trees to be saved, versus what ended, which versus the end result. Yeah. So, Laura, is that is this a fair representation of what the conservation easement is going to look like? It's to the north of that. So there's the so that's actually a, a four foot berm, and then yep, that area right there is the conservation easement. So that is not going to be disrupted. Okay, so that's quite a buffer then between these these homes. Yep, um, so there's the homes, the backyard, the berm with the landscaping, and then a conservation easement. Jeremy, do we have any utilities back there that may still need to be accessed? Uh, no. No? Okay. Now, I know that there's already a lot of um, trees planted and other gardening that, is, that has occurred in this site over the years. So um, I, I think the intent would be to keep that the same. Laura? Yes, the, there's, there's no landscaping that's proposed in there right now. Okay. No landscaping? So right now the residents are encroaching and using it for gardens? Correct. Is that gonna continue? Yeah. Yes. So they'll, they've agreed to take care of it? No, the residents are going to take right. No, but when or, the residents move then, on, or it could it could revert back to nature if they if they, if they so wish. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be maintained by by us or or the developer or the or the HOA there. Okay. There, well, yeah. I mean, if there's an HOA here, I, no, I'm talking about the HOA in this Plymouth Walk. No, no they will no. maintain the berm, and, and that's they it. They maintain the berm. So this this is this would be up to the residents who live along the south there all right so there's disturbed so that the garden has been deed it how are you handling the easement the easement will be um granted to the the conservation easement will be granted to the downtown development authority um, by the developer uh, because currently the developer owns up to the the hash mark line here however the entire project is is within the downtown development authority so uh, the conservation easement will be deeded to the, to the DDA. So the conservation easement goes north to the dotted line? Yes. Correct. Correct. All and right. then, then you have the hard black line, and then you have the berm that would, be, that would right. be built as well. So when and if the neighborhood decides not to encroach on it or use it for gardening, then the DDA will be taking care of mowing it and keeping the... Oh, no. It would revert back to nature, and it would be forested, uh, forested area. There's no need to maintain it. It's not, it's not park space or anything. It's, it's a. So if it grows tall buffer. weeds, that's okay. It's yeah. It's because it will grow tall weeds if you abandon it. Well, it's not abandoned. It's it's no, it reverts no, back to nature. No. So. I'm talking reverting to nature is tall weeds, initially. So what I'm trying to anticipate is when the neighbors decide they don't want to use it anymore, are they going to be asking the DDA to maintain it? And I say maybe, because I, it will be kind of messy looking. No. No? I'm, no? Okay. It's not being maintained right, it's only being maintained by the residents right now. If they choose not to maintain it, it'll, it'll, re, it'll be green space behind their home. So it's an easement, which means that it, they have the, they have the privilege or the, to, um, maintain it, but they don't have the duty to maintain it, right? That's a fair statement, yeah. Is that an accurate statement, Kevin? Yeah. Okay, you've got my, I'm, I'm okay on that part. Okay, Trustee Dershowitz, if you could go back to those slides. There's just one more on the tree preservation. Next one. Yes, please. All right, so this table shows the, the second column here when the board reviewed the PUD option in April, the number of trees that were to be saved, including those that are heritage trees or, or non-exempt heritage trees or, or non-heritage trees. Um, and in total, an additional 10 heritage trees have been saved by kind of you know, reworking some of the, the, the um, footprints of the site. Um, and an additional, for a total of 41 additional trees that have been preserved. So um, at the same time, they've been able to preserve some additional trees and they have 
Also installed over 100 additional trees just to provide, as we recommended, for some softening of the site. So the planting, I looked at the planting plan. Uh, I'd like to see more red oaks, which is the climax tree in that area. They grow very well and okay. diminish the number of non-native species like Austrian pine, which tend to be affected by disease. And unfortunately, white pine gets a weevil and turns them into a bush. So you may want to diminish them a little bit. But if you plant trees that are more native, uh, you may have more success long term. So I just see red oak grows very well there. In fact, that's what you, most of the heritage trees in there are probably red oaks. Okay. okay. We just need to look at that. I noticed some European trees. I would, I would discourage that because also pollinators, uh, like butterflies, prefer, they actually discriminate against non-native species. So it doesn't help them. Pollination, bees and hummingbirds and things like that. Okay. They, they tend to like native. And red oak has probably supports more than any other tree in the Midwest different wildlife and uh, uh, insects. They're, they're a very prolific tree for attracting uh, natural phenomena. We can, we can certainly work at the developer on that. The only problem is they get oak wilt, so you have to be you know, a little careful in planting them too close okay. to each other. Right, we will look into that. Um, so those are some of the, the key changes um, since April. Uh, the Planning Commission, like I said, reviewed this in August and recommended that the Board of Trustees unanimously, it was a unanimous recommendation to approve. Um, there is a resolution in your packet this evening. The PUD contract has also been reviewed by the township attorney. Um, the, recommend, or the resolution and the recommendation both state that um, the, any approval would be con conditional on those legal documents being addressed to the complete satisfaction of the attorney. And the applicant is here this evening if you have additional questions for them. Uh, let's talk about the finishes on the buildings. Those will be set later, or what's on the drawing will be set by this PUD. What is what is in the final siding specifically? The final plan um, development plan that is the exhibit that's in your packet that will that sets the the facade materials. So what's on the drawing upstairs on the second floor? is set by the Planning Commission already? Yes. Or by tonight? It has been approved by the Planning Commission, yes. Wanted to thank the developer. Is it true by me looking at the drawing, I'm 100%, there is no vinyl siding being used. It's all fibrous cement. All right, big difference from what's at the Pulte development on Mill Street, which is using vinyl on the backside and already people are saying, hey, it doesn't look so good because you, it caves in, it goes con, concave and you can see the joints easily. It's just not, I'm sorry, what's funny? No, it's not, I'm, I'm just making an observation. I'm not, don't worry, Chuck. I, I agree with you completely, actually. Um, so thank you for making it better siding, which will be more durable and be more resistant to the sun in the long term and won't, you, when you sight down it, you won't see the weaving, waving lines after a hot day. Okay, any other questions for Laura Haw at this time? I have questions about the road and this huh? thing in front of us. Are you gonna be, is somebody gonna be presenting? Steve Mann will answer any questions that you may have about that. So we can alternate between Steve and uh, Laura. Steve, if you want to come forward at this point, uh, then we can have the two of you uh, respond simultaneously. Yes, I, I can address mainly the financing. Uh, His question was about the road. Section so. six, right, correct. Okay. Yep. Well, you just summarize this. Maybe, did you send this out by email? I might have missed it. We sent it out on Friday afternoon. Okay, all right. Sue Bram sent it out, so, to everybody. So, can you summarize the 
portion on the spine road and then what is being done with East Lawn and General Drive. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Um, so section six of the agreement provides that the developer is going to pave, as we've discussed previously, the streets to the north of the development. Rather, the developer is going to provide funds to the township so the township can pave those roads. And the funds will be provided in the amount of a little over $1.8 million over a five-year period without interest. Um, the spine road within the development will be prepared to Wayne County standards, but will be a private road. And the developer, in return for some consideration paid by the DDA to the developer, will dedicate that spine road to public access. So does the developer have the right in the future to close the road? No, you would not. No. No. So if, it, if the money is advanced over a five-year period, that means that we're fronting the money up, we're fronting the money in order to pave the streets? And then yes, in some fashion, the money would have to be fronted before the project starts. The, so the DDA provides a half a million dollars to the developer, and then right. construction on the roads to the north is done by the township. Right. Using their money and the 1.8 million. And I, I don't think it would be prudent to have construction starting immediately as, as the ground is broken here. I think the idea would be to time it in such a way that if, if this project is fully operational by, let's say, summer of 24, that the roads to the north would be completed. Jer Jeremy, probably in like the spring of, of maybe fall of 23 or, or spring of 24. Right, depending on the timing on when the agreement is signed and the money comes in, there's obviously design. So it's gonna take a few months just to get through design, get through permitting, get everything up to speed. But, and, the, uh, but you would have yes. problems with that if we're waiting on five annual installments, right? Right, so the, the timing um, doesn't have to be right away, right? You could wait until the initial installment comes in or the second installment and then... What does that do to the, ro the existing roads then? Uh, what do you I mean, mean do, as far as... Uh, as far as dirt and, and you know, the, the overall development look? Oh, it won't be completed. It'll be under construction. Right. Yeah, it's going to take it's going to take some time to complete that development and... Um, the goal would be to get those roads operational before the development is completed, is completed and people okay. are, are right. living there. But, sure, but and yeah. there's no construction traffic allowed in those roads to the north. We've already talked about that. That's going to be addressed during engineering review as well. So, so the estimate to pave the four streets is $1.8 million. And what's the likelihood that it's still going to be $1.8 million by the time we pave it? Uh, I mean, Unlikely. it depends on the climate, right? We can forecast as, as much as we can. We added contingencies in there. We added some additional buffer to and, hopefully accommodate then, that. Is it your expectation that we would, we would, the township would pay the $1.8 million and then be reimbursed at over five years? Is that, what, is that what you expect? Yeah, there's a, there's an, I think the agreement includes an initial installment, like a, a day one, so it's not the entire yeah. 1.8. There's, no there's, there's like five different tr <clears throat> tranches, if you will. So the, so the township, the DDA puts $500,000 into, into the pot uh, at, at time of beginning of construction. So when the, when the permit is issued, is that right? Uh, or when the construction date. begins? Because cash flow, shovel in the ground. So. Bob, you'll have to worry about this because it's a cash flow thing. We got to be paying attention to. I, I understand. So that. there's so there's five hundred thousand from the DDA, and then in year one there's like I don't know what it is three seventy eight or something like that, and then this year two there's three seventy eight. So if you use April first as your as your kickoff, you mean twenty twenty three? Twenty twenty three. So you're looking at five hundred thousand plus three seventy five plus three seventy five, and then. Once the, once the project is done, then the brownfield kicks in, reimburses the DDA 500000 You get the five, The DDA gets the $500,000 back in the first three years of, of the brownfield plan. So when, I'm, I'm still confused as to what dates from the, let's just take beginning of construction. When is the first payment due from the developer? 
Well, construction would be what shovel in the ground is or it, permit okay, granted. Just say uh, day Spring. one of. I I don't know. I mean, I, I think it would make a lot of sense to have it's that in the date contract. Be, it is? Yeah, I, I, I think yes. actually some of these terms are yet to be finalized before yeah. the agreement's signed. I'm so sorry, they need, they're yet to be what? Some of these terms are still going to be finalized before the final version of the agreement is signed with the developer. Well, on page well, that's five. That's what we're approving today is the final one, right? Substantial form, but it, it, as it indicates in the resolution that it's subject to. Conditions. Um, it's the first payment is due upon the, the later of 10 days after the conditions have been satisfied and 30 days after the township com commences construction of the improvements. So then you've got to go up and look at what the conditions are approving the owner's brownfield plan is the condition, right, of the property. That, that's one of the conditions. And brownfield as, as plan. I said, these, these will be finalized. And the brownfield the plan goes to the brownfield authority next month. And then that plan go, comes to this board more than likely in late October or November. Well, it might be a good idea to graph this out, Bob, because with interest rates climbing, and you have to know when you're going to borrow money. And um, I'm a little concerned about the timing so that we're. That's fair. Mm -hmm. Oh, nothing's really. It's, fair. it's not about no. fair. It's about just doing, no. just making sure we no, we know when we're fair. spending. No, good, your, your concerns yeah. are fair. Your concern yeah. is fair, is what we see. I, I also want to point out too that I, I don't know if it's in the PUD, but we've made it very clear to the developer that that they do not bring any construction traffic through the East Lawn neighborhood. Okay, so that Correct. no truck traffic, no survey crews, or anything like that. So anything that happens up there is is us and our, our contractors. Yes, they, they are aware of that and okay. acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, my concern's pretty obvious that uh, we're going to be giving them a, basically an interest-free loan. Well, and the, the neighborhood to the north benefits, obviously, from, their, from the investment of the $1.85 million and um, a substantial public improvement to that, um, to that neighborhood. Yeah. I don't disagree. But if interest rates went to 20% like they right. did in 1982, then you'll have a squeeze. Right. We'll be squeezed on many levels at that point, I'm sure. So. Well, we survived just fine in 1982. Yeah. Township's still here, but we didn't borrow money in 1982, apparently. Oh, no, I don't have those yeah. rights. Well, I do. We didn't borrow money. <laughs> they always were bragging about how they, didn't, they paid everything cash in those days. Well, they only had one cop. <laughs> we had no cops. No, Zero. You had me. Had Don't get it. I'm not nobody. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other element of uh, Section 6, which I reviewed, has to do with the conservation easement, which we've already discussed. The other provisions are subject to review by planning and by the township attorney. Right. So, Mark, so... Um, so you've been, uh, you've been working this out with, with their attorney, still subject to final review by our, our attorney, the township attorney. I mean, That's you're correct. our attorney too, I know, but correct. you're the Brownfield attorney. So, um, uh, and that's, that's boilerplate that we, we incorporate in many of our more complex agreements. Okay, so East Lawn and all of the, the subdivision roads will remain as county roads. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. All right, and the maintenance the county will continue to do, which they don't do now, but I mean, well, yeah. they, they, <laughs> they'll uh, do what they're already doing. Yeah, yeah, if they get a change of heart in five years or something, and they plow the road or... I, I certainly plan on talking. We're, you know, we're going to have a new county commissioner next year, Terry Marecki, we know that, and uh, she also chairs the, the Public Works Committee for, for Wayne County. Um, and the county uh, benefits from this deal as well, because right now they do grade the road. Uh, they do apply the... Um, the anti-dust control. Um, they we pay for that, though, the dust. Yeah, but they, they have to do that. I mean, they do the work, mm -hmm. and they, they do the grading and, and all that. So, um, you know, no guarantees, but I, I, think, I think if we demonstrate to the county that the township and the developers are willing to make this investment in the community, that, that maybe they may want to contribute as well. And that might be, we should probably put that on our... Are asking, you mean contribute uh, to the list. paving? Sure, why, we, it's worth trying, worth asking for. You know what they're going to? What they always ask for is, have you have? Is there been any local match? 
And here we have a substantial local match. So. And they have plenty of money. Yeah, right. So the spine road in 25 or 40 years, and it deteriorates, and the homeowners association can't raise the money to fix it, does that become an issue for us or anybody else? Because typically roads deteriorate in developments relatively quickly, but that's partly because they cheated on the specs. Here they're going to allegedly have county specifications. So tell me about that scenario. Then the, the, the legal obligation for maintenance would be on the HOA and the property owners within the development. There'd be no legal obligation for the township. Would this be considered then like a site condominium or how, how is that organized? Would, or they would just have an HOA? You want to come up? They'll, they'll, have, a ma they'll have a master deed and generally, master deed. Yeah, generally we go through the master deed and uh, talk through the language on maintenance and how the costs are split up amongst the condos versus the um, apartments, apartments right? et cetera. So there will, that'll all be discussed and, and uh, developed in the master deed. So, so are the apartments a member of the HOA? So, oh, good evening. I can answer some of these questions yeah. sure. if you don't mind. Uh, just a reminder, Alex Martin, president of the Midwest Division for Toll Brothers. Um, so, we'll be setting up an HOA for the condominiums, which is very traditional. Most of us probably have, have had those in the past. Um, and then the apartments will be essentially the master of all the common elements. Um, they will be collecting dues from our homeowners as well as participating as part of their end of the bargain. As a common element, which that road will be, we, through the HOA, through state laws and all the governance that goes along with it, we're not only going to have to record documents, there's also going to have to be a budget that reflects not just the operation and maintenance, which is day-to-day -day plowing, mowing, what have you, a very detailed reserve analysis, which says, what's the lifespan of that road? Just use that one element. You know, Say it's 25 years and it costs in today's dollars a million dollars to replace it, whatever that dollar amount <coughs> is. We have to demonstrate through the state before we can even open for sale that there is a HOA budget that has a reserve component that allows them over that lifespan of that road to collect an appropriate amount of dues to replace it over time. Um, and then prior to handing over the HOA, the developer will control the HOA until a certain period of time. When we transition, there's a transition study that's done and you know the HOA, if they're smart, they hire their own attorney and their own reserve study is completed and they're validating all of our original assumptions that have already been validated by ourselves. Uh, again, we're, we're a pretty big developer. We're pretty good at can drive through any of our communities that are 25 years old. The roads are not falling apart because um, we set the HOAs up correctly. Um, but then they're also testing the validity of our underwriting relative to the reserve study to ensure it's made whole. Um, there's all kinds of statutory requirements. It goes back to the 80s when HOAs were not funded correctly in the 90s. Um, it's really hard for a developer to get away with underfunding. Um, so it shouldn't be an issue. It will never fall back on a burden of the city or the township. Um, and if done correctly, the HOA will never be special assessed for it either because they should be eating the elephant one bite at a time every month. Yeah. So that master deed will be approved by our attorney and us? So. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. So we, we generally review it for applicability uh, related to making sure all the requirements, uh, all the items are within that master deed. And then if there's any questions on our end, we usually Because it's news to me, uh, maybe it's because of what you said, the laws were different, that a reserve was required and had to be in the master deed. Because many homeowners associations or condo associations have no reserve for taking care of their roads or their driveways or anything else. They use a special assessment. And that, that usually happens one of two ways. It goes back to developments in the 80s and 90s, maybe in some of the early yeah. 2000s, where the developers weren't held accountable through the checks and balances of statutory requirements. Um, that would be problem one. The only other time you see, and it's fairly rare, is we may set it up correctly, but if the HOA decides to come in and say, well, now that we control the board, we don't want to pay $100 a month, we want to pay $50 a month, that could cut into that as well. Um, but then they, they're only hurting themselves because inevitably they'll be special assessed. Um, so the likely, again, I, I would say drive to any of our communities in this general area. Most, if not all, of them have private roads. And I, I can't imagine you're going to see road failures on communities that we built out. We started developing here in the late 90s. So, so what's, what prevents them from rating the reserve fund? There's right, they can only use it for certain things. There's operations and maintenance. And there's funds for that. And then there's funds that are for 
reserve components. Now remember, they're not operating the blind. There's a management company that will operate it. There's a oh. board kind of like you all, you know, there's a board, you know, for the HOA that governs all of this. Well, so they you can't just decide. rate the call first. A management company is not required. They could decide to do it themselves. Correct, but they have to be, they have to file taxes. I mean, they have to do all, there's all kinds of checks and balances. They have to submit taxes. Everything has to be audited on an annual basis. You can't, it, you can't just raid the call for us because you're on the board. You, you can't sit and go, you know, on a wild hair. Um, a lot of stuff has to be voted on. It, it's, again, I, I understand the concerns, but I, I, I would go drive through, you go to Northville Hills Country Club, you know, that, that's thousands of houses. You go to Island Lake of Novi, those are all private roads, and you're not going to see roads deteriorating in our communities. Well, Northville um, Hills, did a, they did a paving project recently. I think well, the, the one that's attached to the golf course in the last two or three years. Yeah, that job's probably useful life of those roads are starting yeah. to hit. But mm -hmm. it, it's not a question if work has to be done. It's is it funded correctly? There's always work to be done, but is it funded? Um, we haven't heard of it. Plus, we would be the first ones to get contacted and uh, by an attorney if they felt the reserves weren't appropriate and people were being special assessed. And we have not had that happen. So, and the majority of our projects here in Michigan are private roads. So that's just the way of, of this market for some reason. So, private roads are the majority of your developments? Many of them, yes. Really? Okay, hey, any other questions for the developer, the attorney, or the planner, or the yes. engineer? Let's look, look at the eight foot high vinyl fence. The color looks like it's brown, is that true? Yes. Um, the neighbors who back up to it, do they want an eight foot high fence, or is there? Originally it was an eight foot white fence. That's ugly. And then yeah. we just, exactly, and we agreed, I think collectively as a group in one of the many meetings we've had to make it brown. That, that was a collective decision. I, don't, I believe it's from the planning commission and neighbors and I, I thought it was similar to the one that's been built that was built by the um, okay. the pipeline people Plastipac. next to Plastipac. Uh, if you drive if you right if you here. drive into the Plastipac parking lot, there's a there's a pipeline easement and when the pipeline company came through a couple of years ago, they removed all the trees in the in the easement and we had them we made them install a a, a brown vinyl fence. And I, I think it's that comparable color that, that we're looking at here. It is, and it's eight foot. Yeah. And it's eight feet. And what was done in consultation with the, with the residents to the extent that, yeah, that was a collaborative it could decision. be done. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so these people will be completely isolated from the neighborhood of Gold Arbor. Correct. Yes, there's no, there's no pathway connection. No. Or road. California style. Yeah. And I know that there's some documents that you will see where it talks about connecting, where the, the spine road is connecting to Gold Arbor. And, and I think that's just more of a quirk of the way that, the, that easements and, and roads have been recorded over decades. Um, there is no connection to Gold Arbor Street whatsoever to this development. What's, what happens is that down here, down here is where the spine road connects to the to the driveway entrance here. Which used to be Gold Arbor. Which used to be Gold Arbor. Now I've had some old cops tell me that back in the day you could drive from Ann Arbor Trail to Ann Arbor Road along Gold Arbor. That's true. But, That's but true. that has been that man right there negotiated closing them. That well. So anyway, so this area here is fully closed off. There's no plans to reopen it in any way whatsoever. It's just that this little piece right here still called is Gold. still called Gold Arbor, and I believe it's still under the legally under the control of Wayne County. Wayne County. Yeah. So who is going to be responsible for maintaining that piece? This, this piece is always maintained by by no by Harvey Weiss, well, Harvey who Weiss. Harvey Weiss who who owns this you know this, the the mall over here. And he's so, doing that out of the goodness of his heart. So what happens if he decides he doesn't want to do it anymore? Uh, we would have to check the PUD that we have with Harvey Weiss for that. For well, that I think this is an open issue that needs to so, be addressed. Well, it, you know, it's been it's maintained all the time because the tenants in that in that strip mall that's their access route. So no, my point is, I mean, when it deteriorates and it has to be repaved, is Harvey Weiss or his successors going to say you wore that out because of that thousand residents who are going to be living there? I don't want to pay for it. We got to think about these things now. Let's get oh, we already, get, it, we, get it settled. 
Yeah, there's going to be an access agreement uh, with uh, Harvey Weiss and with them because they're going to need that to uh, connect their private road to his private property. Usually within those access agreements, there's a, a discussion on uh, repayment or cost sharing of that piece of the road. That's generally how we handle this. This is no different than... We are going to get to approve that on this board? Uh, I mean, it's part of the PZE process, part of planning. and Part of the what? Uh, part of the PZE process where we get, you know, final engineering plans. We have a list of things that we need to collect before it goes to construction. Like so. a stormwater permit. And yeah. Exactly. But, it, but this cost sharing is a legal thing that has to be defined now, not when the problem comes up 20 years from now. We've met with Harvey Weiss. They've met with Harvey Weiss. I mean, we're all aware that this... It won't come up 20 years from now because it'll be in the access. It'll be in the pay. It'll be in writing what percent this development will pay and what percent Plymouth Walk will pay. Correct. And that, right. that number could be zero where Harvey Weiss is paying all of it, but they'll have a legal agreement that states what those stipulations are, and that'll be filed with the county. As a part of the, they, they won't get uh, uh, final engineering approval and won't be able to go to a pre-construction meeting until they have all these agreements and easements executed. Yeah, I just don't want residents being burdened with a road that doesn't work in 20 years while people argue about who's going to pay for it. And that's why they thought about it, so they're talking about it now. They're already in, 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 in I beg your pardon? It's, they're already in yeah. the discussions yeah, but, about it. Yeah, but we need to see it in writing. That's what I, I'm, when I is get it? that. When is that coming? They're already in discussions. Okay. I'm it, sorry. I beg your pardon? That's, we're talking about it. Okay. So I don't see it written down here. That's why I'm asking the question. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Any other questions for anybody? Yes. One more. The minutes for the Planning Commission of August 17th are not in here. Please tell me what went on in that meeting and how the vote went. Bob, Allegedly, our, somebody changed You're our vote. representative. You go, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> At the uh, August the, meeting, we presented the revised changes to the final development plan since the July meeting. Walked the Planning Commission through those in our report. Um, engineering detailed their report. No changes were, uh, no comments, or no, there were no additional comments from the fire department. Uh, no changes there. And then the Planning Commission took a vote. There were no public comments, and um, there were no further questions or concerns for the developer at that okay, time. Okay, the question I have is, it says there was no additional public comment. Correct. Was public comment allowed? Yes. Always. It was allowed. Okay. All right, let's pull up the video. So, allegedly it was not, so I want to make certain what the truth is. Play the video. Oh. Really? Are we going to no. Are we going to have a mini yeah. trial? Well, what yeah. is the truth? If it's written down, was July. Yes. In July. Pardon? You, 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 so you're, you're talking my language when so you say Dennis allegedly. Did not was public commitment, uh, public comment allowed at the planning commission meeting regarding this? I don't know. Yes or no? I don't know. A resident told me that it wasn't allowed. Oh, no, it wasn't. Oh, I, I cannot imagine that Dennis Sobolski, who has been Planning Commission Chairman for, what, 20 years or right, more, 20. Would, would not be okay. allowing public comment. The Planning I'm Commission relaying what hours and hours yep. of public testimony yep. on this. Don't on shoot this the event. messenger. I'm telling I'm you not, what the I'm not. Yeah. I'm just I'm defending the Chairman of the Planning Commission. And how was the vote? And unanimous, in favor. Wait a minute, I thought he changed his vote. That was on another project. Another item. Okay, all right. So it was unanimous. Correct. Yep. That means everybody voted yes. <laughs> I just want to put one statement on record. I have driven these streets. The streets have been neglected. There's been a lack of oversight, accountability, and maintenance. And allegedly, the responsibility is Wayne County. So I just want to leave it at that. Understood. All right, any questions in the, from the audience at this point? Come on down. Thank you. Pardon me? Open what? I you can't can talk you. right now, but take that well, thing usually off. Usually you make an announcement that we have open. Yeah, we have open discussion. I, I made that statement at the beginning of the meeting. No, that's for a public hearing. Yeah, that's a different animal. Okay. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Jay Steele. I've spoken on this topic a number of times. I live at that on Waverly, which is to the north of this development. The berm that's going to be behind my house has changed at every meeting. 
I prepared some things, but then again today I'm presented with information at this meeting that was not available on the township website about that firm and other issues. Um, as far as I know, there are utilities in that easement behind my house. I believe electrical and cable runs through there. I'm not sure how far back you're talking. Um, I know this is going to go through. I've been, you can tell by the number of residents that still come to these meetings how our thoughts have been heard. Alex has, has done some nice things as far as the cosmetics. But the Planning Commission and the Board of Trustees, the number of people that are going to live in this neighborhood, this neighborhood that we're all in right now, where very few of us live that are in this room, is going to change dramatically. I've sat through several meetings of this group and the Planning Commission, where over in the west side of the township, they can't have 70-foot lots because you can't get a side entry garage in out there. And a front entry garage won't fit. If we could pull up page 136 of the packet. So let's look at these little houses here on Furwood and my house over there, literally. And then let's look at page 136. And we've already voted, I know, but the building, this is the finances which I tried to follow through and I'm a mechanical engineer, not an accountant. Can we, I'm sorry, I'm, that is the wrong page. Um, page 66 of the site plan and 57. We have a 39 and a half foot average height on these buildings. That's the average height. And if you look at that line, it does go above that. Those are gonna be the apartments. The size of that building is bigger than anything on this side of the township. I don't know how they compare to the Beaumont facility, but there, there's more of them. And the road situation and how we're gonna pay for the road and all those things are very troubling to a township resident. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Wait, wait, don't walk, don't, don't walk away. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, none of us live behind the Elks property. Have you, as a resident who lives behind the Elks property, been presented with a prospective traffic flow study? No. The, the road opening came later in the project and get to the mic or get oh, closer sorry, the road to the mic. opening came later in the project and the connection to that neighborhood and those streets i don't know how we're going to fit widening in there um mike how far do we go with the approvals before we get some of these permits and this financing nailed down like if we approve this today are all these ducks in a row? Because as far as I can tell as a resident, this is my last chance to see anything. And I, I see things every meeting that I hadn't seen before I got here. And this is all gonna be closed to us. Am I correct? I don't know if I can ask a question. There are many, most of these contracts have to come before the various boards and commissions, planning commission, DDA, Brownfield Authority, and the Board of Trustees. This is an ongoing project. Uh, Many other legal agreements need to be executed and that will occur within the next, over the next several months in public meetings just like we've been doing for a year and a half. Okay, so these financing agreements and dates and uh, Mr. Kermy's questions about the road condition and who's gonna repair that, because this road is gonna get a lot more traffic than I would guess most of their private road developments do because it's a through road. If you've driven Lily or Haggerty or gone through that neighborhood when there's a train, cars are gonna plow through there. We closed the other neighborhood so that that wouldn't happen. And now we're gonna open this one up. I don't understand that. So the answer to my question, Mr. Steele, was no. No, I have not. How long have you lived there? I've lived at that house since 2014. I lived off of Annabelle Trail, closer to Haggerty, since 2001. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Is it open? Yes. Good evening. You can pull that down a little, I think. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Nell Burke. Um, I have been asked by people in my neighborhood about a rumor. And so I guess I would like some answer uh, from the board this evening, if possible, that our taxes, our property taxes next year 
will go up at the rate of inflation. No. Is there any truth to that? Okay, this is a, it's a great question, it, I, I, I'm, and, I, and I will answer it. So under, under, the, under Prop A, which was voted in by the Michigan voters in 1994, your property taxes, everybody, local, all local governments in Michigan, property taxes go up by the rate of inflation or 5%, whichever is greater. Okay, oh, which I'm sorry, whichever is less. Good, Mr. Treasurer here, he should know these things. <laughs> it's one of the two. So, less so, so over the years, over the last decade, um, property taxes have been held to the rate of inflation, and the rate of inflation has been about 1.2%, 1.5%. .5%. And so your taxes have gone up all yes. of those years because of the rate of, because it's because of Prop A and tied to the rate of inflation. Now, um, Due to rampant inflation in this country over the last two years, we have the, the property taxes for, for this calendar year are going up by 3.3%, and that's based on the inflation rate from 2021. Two years two back. Years. Uh, the average? Yeah, yeah. Okay. two year average. Cool. Tax rates don't go up, the SEV The small. SEV goes up, yeah. yeah. But your the taxes, taxable value. The taxable value goes up. Goes up. Right. So next year, it'll, it'll more than likely be 5%. 4% or 5% based on the inflation rates that we're experiencing nationwide right now. And that goes back to Proposition A of 1994. So, which cut in property a, taxes in half. Now what if you're in an residence. uncapped, so, so I'm going to open it up to the, my, my team of experts. So what if, you're in an, what if you're still in a capped property? Still goes up 5%. 5%. Um, well, the SCV or ta taxable, taxable value. value can go up by 5%, but that doesn't necessarily mean your taxes go up by 5%. The math doesn't quite work that way. And meanwhile, you've got the Headley Amendment, which was voted in in 1972? Eight. 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 So. so the Headley Amendment, does it go property by property if you're under the Headley Amendment? Like I bought my house seven years ago. Seven years ago. Okay. Yes. So you're, uh, you're in, you would be in an uncapped property. Okay. So my so Headley, taxes. Headley still affects everybody, but the reduction in your millage rates are, are really relatively small. And they, they are outweighed by the... Mr. Treasurer, jump in here anytime. They're, they would be outweighed by the... Um, increase to your to your SEV. Yeah. So you have two things going on. Headley affects the tax rate. Proposition A of 1994 affects the taxable value, the value of your home. And taxable value is defined as one half. But once you've been in the house as long as you have, it's just tracking the inflation factor that the assessor sends you in a notice every March 1. So on March 1 of 2023, you will get a notice that will say what your new taxable value is. And to calculate your taxes, well, it'll give you an estimate of how much your tax taxes will go up on the left side of the page. And then they multiply the millage rate. I don't know, our millage rate Bob is what, about 31? Yeah. So you multiply that $31 per thousand times the number of thousands you have in the taxable value, and that's your property tax for the year. Okay, so it will go up considerably yes. next year. It's going to go up the highest amount since 1994. Never has it. Mm -hmm. Never, ever since 1994 has the tax rate has gone will be going up as much as it's going to go up next year. That's mm -hmm. because of rapid inflation. That has nothing to do with what we've done. That's what the federal government and the state does, making the inflation rate high. And so it tracks the inflation rate. So it will consumer go up. price index. When you the see CPI. the word CPI, that's what it's calculated on for the region, the Metro Detroit yeah, region. The Detroit CPI. So my so, concern as a homeowner yes. and a retired fixed budget. Yep. Yeah. Uh, citizen, uh, is that it's this is driving me out of being a homeowner. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to afford to live in my home. 
and the way housing is right now, I'm also not going to get as much money for my home. Um, yes, these this are is perilous times. We haven't seen anything like this in 40 years. That's why elections matter. That's why elections matter. <laughs> elections do matter. And believe me, I vote in every one. But I don't know that an election would have fixed this problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because you're saying the inflation, it would? The inflation problem or the... Oh, the inflation uh, problem, it will, okay. yes. Because <laughs> I'm, no. I'm, still, I'm still on... The, the inflation uh, problem, still it on will, the development here. Yes. Next okay. subject. Um, all right. I'm very saddened by this. Um, moved into my house seven years ago. Left a condo in downtown Plymouth because this was the house for a retired disabled woman. One floor, bathroom accessible. Hey, Leo Gonzalez should be garage, here. And now I'm not going to be able to live there. Yeah. yeah. What street are you on? I'm on Maryland. Across oh, yeah. the street. Maryland. Yeah, Maryland. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is affecting, and there are so many senior citizens in my neighborhood that this is going to have devastating effects on. Yeah. Uh, the, and the, I don't know what the additional tax money, I don't know how it's improving my community. My community has not improved since I've moved in there. As a matter of fact, it has gone down. 70% of it goes as to wages and benefits for employees at the township. No, the majority goes to the state, the county, county the school district. district. Well, yeah, that part of it, but our Library. portion. But ours goes up 5% too. I know, but the majority does not go to the township. Right. This is not the township taxing you. Well, it's everybody is taxing. All taxing authorities. Library. Yep. Wayne County. Anybody else? Okay. Can you hear me with my mask on? Oh, please take it off. Anna Steele, Jay's wife. Um, just a couple questions and then trying to clarify what exactly is going on with these roads. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize. Jeremy, with the roads that are in East Lawn, did I misunderstand those roads are, they're all going to be paved, yes. We're expecting that a group of people who couldn't afford to pay the road is going to hire an attorney at Alex's suggestion, which is a good suggestion, to handle HOA issues. And are all those, Kurt, is there a reason you're shaking your head at me? I'm yeah, I am. I am, and, I, and I'll be happy to explain when you're, when you're done with your question. Great. Thank you. Um, so the roads to the north in East Lawn are not in an HOA. Those are owned by Wayne County, so Wayne County will maintain them for the future. Mm -hmm. What we were talking about with the HOA was for the, the subdivision that's being developed, mm -hmm. the right. development. Mm -hmm. So we're going to attach, and Wayne County has approved that, to open up from Ann Arbor Road all the way through to Furwood? So Wayne, Wayne County is working with us on the redevelopment of the roadways in East Lawn. This is a private road, which is voted on and um, approved by the township. Correct. So they're, they're connecting to it like a private road, which, yes, is approvable. Say it's, it again. Can you repeat that? The connection of the private road to the public roads to the north is approvable, meaning we get through the site plan, we know that this will be approved once we get all of the documentation in place to show what the design is. We still have an entire another phase called engineering plan review where they have to put together construction documents where they show that the roadway is going to meet a certain standard which is spelled out in our ordinance, spelled out in Wayne County's, right. etc. So. Right. so according to two directors of engineering at Wayne County and one senior engineer, you've requested that the, that be opened up and they told you no. Is that? No, that's okay. not true. So I guess I need to do a FOIA because I, I talked to them as early as this afternoon and they said, no, they do not recommend that because it does not meet the needs of a Wayne County road. 
So I think what you may be referring to is whether or not they would allow a public road to continue from East Lawn all the way to Gold Arbor and out through Ann Arbor Road. And the reason they don't recommend that is because they don't like to add another public road that ties into a private road. I don't want to interrupt I, you, but that's not what I'm referring to. And well, I but I, I did discuss this directly with real estate, the director of engineering, the previous Which director one, and, of engineering? Uh, both Anamish and Sammy. So both of them. Okay. As of today, they're telling me no. Okay. So um, for the record, I just want it to be clear that according to Wayne County, as of this morning, they do not want this opened up. They don't feel it's safe. They feel that it puts the residents in the complex that's being developed at risk. The vast majority of those people, although they want the road paved, do not want this road opened up. It's not safe. It drops straight down to Hines, which is a place where you will dead end into a park where children play. This was not the recommendation of the fire department. This was not the recommendation or the original plan of Toll Brothers to have that road open. They aren't going to get involved and say, hey, no, we, we, we're going to say no. Because, and I quote, having that road open was a part of this, this whole project being allowed to go through. I have it in writing. It disappoints me to have to stand up here and discuss that. And I would be happy to send that to anyone and will send it to everyone because I think it's important that people know. I know my time's ticking away, so bottom line, there are discrepancies in what is being said and what is being heard by other people. And the last thing I have to say is, Miss Buckley, Mrs. Buckley, you turned down a place and you said, that's right across the street from where I live, where my kids live. That's much too high of density. That's too much traffic. That really bothers me that those are things that came from you, yet this is something that's much more massive that everyone seems like, yay, let's get this done. Okay. Did, did you give me the hand to wrap it up? Yeah, I am. Okay, great. Now, can you please tell me what your head shaking was as I was speaking? Uh, well, because I had to answer an email today from a representative of the East Lawn neighborhood who was told that we were going to require a, a homeowners association be created for the East Lawn neighborhood and that they were going to have to pay for the improvements, and I assured her once again that that was not the case. Uh, let's hey, explore can this. You, uh, can you, uh, I'm sorry, are you finished? I'm finished. Um, can you uh, explain what is meant by dedication of Spine Road for public use? What does that mean exactly? That means that although it is a, a private road, the public has a right to use the road. Okay. For ingress and egress. Yes. But that means it remains a private road, right? Correct. Right. Still be a private road. So it's a responsibility of the HOA to maintain that road. That's okay. correct. All right, thank you. Just what is the outcome if we don't get approval from Wayne County to connect the county road to the private road? It's Isn't that a major issue they, here they tonight? Have, they, they have. Yeah, don't yell at me. Well, that's why have, I'm trying to understand. John, John they have. The approval, approval has been granted. Wayne I mean, County has given approval. No. Yes, they that's have. That's what you're saying. There's no signature. Are, are, are we going to FOIA? Well, I, I'll have to FOIA well, their phone. My where is the signature? I, that's what I asked. Well, Gentlemen that they're Chuck, here from uh, Toll Brothers, Chuck. anyone can answer Chuck, that question? Don't yell in my ear, man. It <laughs> hurts. I, I think you. I don't even know how they answer that. Yeah, just. It's I like, mean, Jeremy, Jeremy showed our township engineer has had several communications with Wayne County. Uh, this is their, a, this their is only a red issue herring. with it was uh, w making it a public road. I think initially they, the developer went to the county and asked whether or not it could be a public road. They told them no because it tied into Gold Arbor, which isn't technically a public road. I discussed with them whether or not 
if the developer granted Gold Arbor back to the county as a public road, could it then theoretically be a public road? And the answer is yes. Would they accept that piece of Gold Arbor? I don't know, but it's kind of a moot point now because we're gonna make it a private road so that we can add the additional traffic calming devices to reduce the speed, reduce the number of people who use this as a cut through because that's been a major comment throughout this entire process was trying to nail every one of these things. Well, the county would never accept the traffic no. calming necking down. Yeah, I mean, they, that's not a typical thing that they do. That's not to say that they would never accept it because there are a number of these exact same traffic calming devices in communities across the state, including in Wayne County. Yeah, there's one on Annabur Trail at Forest Avenue. Right. Okay. Mr. Supervisor. Mr. Clerk. I moved to adopt resolution number 2022-09-13-53, 20, authorizing the approval of the plan unit development contract for the Plymouth Walk Residential PUD as recommended by the Planning Commission and subject to any necessary modifications identified by the township attorney. Motions made by Clerk Vorva. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Buckley. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Clerk Forva, yes. Trustee Buckley? Yes. Trustee Kermy? No. Trustee Monahan? Yes. Treasurer Dorshavitz? Yes. Supervisor Heisen? Yes. Trustee Stewart? No. Oh. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll be meeting again, I'm sure. Okay, item F2 is the to award the contract for the 2022 Sidewalk Gap Program. Mr. Schroeder. This is uh, the 2022 Sidewalk Gap Program. We did a sidewalk gap uh, analysis and plan a few, uh, probably almost a year ago at this point that we discussed with the board, went through the priorities, looked at the various options. This was one of the options that uh, we discussed. It's Ann Arbor Trail from the park all the way to Vintage Drive. This will complete a gap from Township Park all the way to the city. This ties into sidewalk that eventually makes its way to the city. We received three bids. Uh, Merlot Construction was the lowest bid. The bids were slightly higher than uh, what they were in the previous year, about 11%, but that's well within what we've seen from everyone else. Everyone else, it's been 30 to 50 to, in some cases, MDOT's had 200% increases. Let me read. Do we have easements from all of the property owners? We don't. All of the sidewalk is going to be constructed within the right of way, except for on the far east end, the last parcel before Vintage Drive. There was an issue with some drainage. Uh, Chuck and I met uh, with the homeowner out there. We addressed that as a part of this project and got a drainage easement to accommodate that. Uh -huh. Interesting. And Thank the you. routing will be a little more efficient, right? The Correct. curve will be... Right. Yeah, there will be curb. There will be bigger curb radius. Gutter. Very similar to uh, North Territorial, the, the sidewalk gap that yeah. we did there. Good. All right. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Well, I have, uh, will we be sending, when will we be sending out a notice to the affected, when I say affected, it will be in their front yard and some of their, do you need to get a construction easement on some of these? No. We need no construction easements. Uh, we will provide notifications, though, prior to construction. Generally, there's uh, door hangers. We provide those a couple days in advance of construction. We also knock on doors, let them know if we're going to be cutting through their driveway and help them you know, move vehicles. And It'd be great if we could access. send them a letter first class ahead of, <laughs> like, a couple of weeks ahead of time or whatever. Sure, sure. Or, so or maybe after tonight saying it's coming. Yeah, we, we can certainly do that because uh, our next step is now, what, once this is awarded, we uh, execute the contracts, get those to the contractors, we get the uh, insurance and bonding back, and then we do a pre-construction meeting, and then we kick it off from there. So the, the question I had today about the crosswalk at Township Park from McClumpha on the right. west side, is there anything in here or will we have to put it on a want list? to have one of these push button warning signs like have been installed recently in the city of Plymouth? Yeah. What are they called? RRFBs or uh, like a hawk signal or an RRFB is, is typical. 
Solar powered, uh, typically, I think. Yeah, uh, Wayne, you know, Wayne County hasn't been terribly uh, fond of those, so we follow the MDOT standard guidelines for uh, advanced um, pedestrian crossing signage and special emphasis part pavement markings, et cetera. So, but that, if we want to add an RRFB in the future, we're going to have to convince Wayne County and then add it to a wish list. Yeah, I think we should put that longer term on our want list because that it, that's a rough intersection because there's a grade to the west and a grade to the east. And so some people may not be able to get enough judgment to cross in time uh, with high speed. Well, keep in mind, there'll be advance warning signs too, well in advance of that crossing. So as you're coming- They're uh, passive they're, signs though, they're not a flasher. Correct, passive yeah. signs, yeah. Passive. All right, you ready for a motion? Sure. I move to adopt resolution 2022-09-13-54, authorizing the Board of Trustees to approve the award for the 2022 Sidewalk Gap Project to Merlot Construction using funds from the 285 ARPA Funds Capital Outlay Project account 285-000-970-0. Point zero 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 dash two zero two two twenty eight five L four five zero four. Good Lord. In the total amount not to exceed six hundred twenty eight thousand four hundred dollars. Motions made by Trustee Kermy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Monahan. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Treasurer Dorsch Evans. Yes. Trustee Kermy. Yes. Supervisor Heisey. Yes. Trustee Buckley. Yes. Trustee Monahan. Yes. Trustee Stewart. Yes. Clerk Former. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, great. This is item F3, award the contract for the Gulf View Park sidewalks and Township Hall sidewalk replacement. So when you say sidewalk replacement at Township Hall, we are referring to the the concrete area Andy. right out in front of the front door here. Now that What's will be the paid, entrance. The entrance, thank you. <laughs> uh, that will be paid for with uh, DDA funds, correct. Okay. Is the bollards in here? They, yeah. they, will, be, they will be removed. removed. Yes. Yeah. Removal. Lighting, there will be new lighting installed on the building itself to illuminate the area, but the bollards are um, very uh, dysfunctional. Um, they're all rusted out, and it, I, we, I think we saved at least $25,000 by, by getting rid of What are you going to do to deactivate the live wires that are out there now. Yeah, so there's uh, stipulations Electrical in the contract. Team. and I've, gonna and bury them. We're going to bury them. It's going to chill them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's stipulations in the contract to remove those conductors from the source. Uh, we've talked to Ken McDonald, and we'll be working with him. You're going to gonna take it back to the electrical, well, yeah, to the, at least exactly. to the building. Yeah, pull it through the conduits, et cetera. We have squir don't, don't we have squirrels at the fire I station they, that yeah. eat, the, eat the wires? <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, it's a true story. It is a true story. Gulfview Park, the trees, I'm concerned about girdling and damages, not only during construction, but mowing. So I just wanted to put that in that we need to be paying attention to the base of these trees, which we, a developer paid a lot of money to give us those trees, and we want them to live. Agreed. Good idea. So I don't know who has the responsibility to keep those trees up. I'm willing to go do something if it's required. Well, right now we're, we're sharing responsibility between the golf course operators and our, our park staff. And they, they cooperate and get it done. Sometimes our guys do it, sometimes. Girdling with it. weed whipping equipment is usually a common way to kill trees, so. Okay, any other questions on this one? All right, I'm going to do this one. I move to adopt resolution 2022-09-1355, authorizing the Board of Trustees to approve the award of the Gulfview Park walkways from the 285 ARPA Funds Capital Outlay Project Account 285-000970.0002228L4503 in the amount of $428,300 and Township Hall Entryway Replacement Project from the 248 DDA funds capital outlay account, 248-727-970.000 in the amount of $103,300 for a total award to Merlot Construction in the amount not to exceed $531,600. Second. Second by Trustee Dorshevitz. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Trustee Stewart. Yes. Trustee Monahan. Yes. Trustee Buckley. Yes. Supervisor Heisen. Yes. Trustee Kermy. Yes. Treasurer Dorshevitz. Yeah. Clerk Borba, yes. 
Motion carries. Great. Okay. Establishment of annual tax rate submission to Wayne County Treasurer. Okay. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but we um, every year it's by September 30th we have to approve what the millage rates are for uh, the township uh, millages that um, will be on the winter tax bills coming out in December. Um, so the um, it's an annual thing. We have the ability to, if you go to the form, let me scroll ahead to the form. Um, so there's five um, millages that are uh, impacted. Uh, the first one on the list is the general charter millage, which is under state law, we're authorized to, um, to uh, um, we're authorized to, to levy up to one mill for general charter uh, township operations. But that real millage rate is permanent, re re reduced by the Headley, Headley Amendment. Um, and there's a factor, which is column six, uh, that you use to multiply what the previous year's millage rate is by the by the reduction factor, which this year is 0 0.9960, and that tells you column seven what your maximum millage is um, that you could assess from that uh, you could levy from that assessed millage or from that voted millage. So um, the five of these that are on here include. The fire millage that was um, passed in 2020 um, and it expires all the way over on the far right in tax year 2040. Uh, the police and fire millage from 2015, um, the second police and fire millage from 2015, and the police and fire millage from 2018. Um, so basically, reading left to right, you go from the date of the election, the orig original millage that was passed by that election or, or charter. Um, column five is the permanent, um, the, um, the, the permanent reduction uh, under state law um, to uh, the Headley Amendment. So what will happen is column five next year, column seven, Next, column five next year will be uh, uh, become column seven, or I said that backwards. Um, column seven will become column five next year. And then it's multiplied by the Headley of reduction of, of 0 0.9960. Column eight is the, the uh, Truth in Assessing Act, which is basically the equalization around the, across the county. So we're equalized at one, which means that we're being, we're properly assessing our uh, properties, if we weren't, um, that that factor would either be lower or higher. Um, so that gives us column nine, which is a maximal allowable millage that we can levy uh, under each of those categories. And the recommendation in column 11, which is what the budget is based on, is to levy those full amounts for a total of 5.1276. Any questions? Who was your fresh eyes on this to check the numbers? I checked them three times. If you'd like to check them, you can come into my office tomorrow. And okay, I'll you did. Is this a uh, Excel spreadsheet or it's all manual entry? It's manual calculated. All right, so you've checked them, or somebody, somebody else checked them. Yeah. Maybe. All right, because this I is did absolutely the math three times. Okay. If you want to do it a fourth time, you're welcome to it. <laughs> Got to be perfect, all right? Okay. How many do you times? Want, do you want to make the motion? I would like to make the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. You've gone totally digital, huh? Is that it? You want me to read Look it? at this. Upside down. Yeah. You have to make it upside down motion. We're getting there. there right, we move go. So I move to approve resolution 2022-09-13-56, hereby approving the attached 2022 tax rate request form L4029 as completed by Treasurer Dorshevitz with a millage rate request of 5.1276 to be levied on December 1st, 2022, and to authorize the township clerk and supervisor to sign the, sign the form and submit it to Wayne County Equalization Division prior to the September 30th, 2022 deadline. Okay, motions made by Treasurer Dorshevitz. Is there a second? Second. Second by Clerk Vorba. Mr. Kirsch, please take the roll. Clerk Vorba, yes. 
Trustee Stewart. Yes. Trustee Monahan. Yes. Trustee uh, Buckley. Yes. Trustee um, Kermy. Yes. Supervisor Heise. Yes. Treasurer uh, Dorshevitz. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Bob, will you be willing to send us out an email of what the total millage for Plymouth Township will be for the December tax bills? Yeah, sure. It doesn't have to be. It's um, on the website, but I'll send out an email. But then now it gets updated, right, with this? It will. Um, yeah, this I'll will send partially out offset. Time. This will partially offset some of the taxable value increase. It does. Yeah. Small, but yeah. So a couple housekeeping items right now. I, I don't believe we need Jeremy for anything for the remainder of the night. So you can. Thank you, Jeremy. You're free to go. Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you. You're going to um, keep us posted on the sidewalk building, right? Yeah. We also have a gentleman in the audience. I, I don't know if you're if you you can certainly stay, but if you had a question for us or anything, we're probably going to be here for at least another hour, hour and a half. So uh, you're good. He's good. Okay. Oh, really I just didn't want to. It's not that we're, we're going to be boring for the next hour and a half. I just don't want you to wait, wait, all, wait all night. For the people online, we have hundreds of people in the audience. Uh, hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. <laughs> okay, Bob, that then. doesn't look good. You're our math man. Uh, oh so we're going to move on to item F5, budget amendments. Ginger. Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. I can, yeah. Okay. I know sometimes you guys can't hear me, so I just want to make sure. So the agenda item before you tonight is for the fiscal year 2022 budget amendments. Um, in the budget amendment request tonight, we're approving general fund appropriations to the amount of $134,900. We're approving American Rescue Plan Act fund appropriations in the amount of $543,600. And we're going to recognize general fund revenue in the amount of 25000 and recognize ARPA fund revenue in the amount of $268,600. When you say recognize, you mean that's, that's a bonus to us? Uh, recognize revenue? revenue means we're going to uh, amend the budget to recognize that we will be um, using revenue that's coming from another source. Okay. So in the budget you. amendment, you will see that general fund is doing a transfer or an expenditure out for the sidewalk gap project, which we had budgeted at $200,000 for fiscal year 2022, but we adopted the budget. Okay. After discussions with our auditor, we have also established a 285 for our ARPA funds. Within the ARPA funds, we had approved in May a budget amendment to do sidewalk gap projects in the amount of $700,000. When discussing the two budgets that were approved by the board, the auditor indicated that both of the funding for the sidewalk gap had to be paid for out of the same fund. So we are canceling budget in the original department where we had approved it for the adoption of the 22 budget. And we are going to approve an expenditure to transfer those funds from general fund dollars of 200,000 over to the 285 ARPA fund. In addition to that, we have recognized in the original adopted fund the budget for the IGA that we received from the Wayne County Park Millage. That is in the amount of $68,600. That is also recognized currently as a general fund revenue. We are going to cancel the budget in the general fund, and we are going to transfer those revenues over to the ARPA fund so that we can utilize the $68,000 as part of the Golf View Park project. So while you see an amount of general fund appropriations, that includes the cancellation of budget and then also the appropriation of additional funds. Um, on page three, or is it page four? Okay, he already has it up. Is the budget amendments at the top, it starts with a general fund amendment, and it shows the total amount of the appropriation of 134900 Below that, the 285 ARPA funds are shown in the amount of 543.6 for a total all funds appropriation of $678,500. Below that, you see the 101 general fund revenues. We will be recognizing $20,000 from um, the payment in lieu of the historical commission for the Purcell property. 
It is my understanding they're going to be paying a payment in lieu of uh, to the township for that property, as well as a local grant that we're going to receive as a pass-through from Friends of the Rouge for um, a leadership commission fall color event. So let's, we're going to back recognize up on those funds, and then we're going to appropriate a budget in the community promotion for those funds to be spent. Okay, so the local grant for the Environmental Commission is $5,000 is coming from the Friends of the Rouge? Correct. And then, and then up here at the, at the top, top you will see that in the community promotional services, we're going to appropriate those funds for the expenditure of the event. Isn't Bosch giving money too? Yeah, it's from, through Bosch from Friends of the Court. Yeah. Or Friends, Fr of, Friends the of the Rouge. Rouge. Not Friends of the Court. No. Not Friends so of the Court. <laughs> Bosch is, is passing it through. The, Bosch is the source of the money. Yes. Correct. And it's going to be given to Friends of the Rouge, and then they have to pass oh, it to that's us. How, that's how it works, yeah. I was told uh, tell me what the Bosch. event is. What are we doing? Well, the Fall Colors event, uh, we did it last year as well. It is hosted by the Environmental Leadership Commission, and I am pulling it up right now on our... But that was a free... I mean, we didn't spend Facebook. any money last year, so what, what is different this year? Oh, they're just here, offering more $5, services. $5,000 to be this spent. This year we're receiving a local grant for the purpose of the event, and we're going to recognize those revenues and receive them so that the local commission can actually spend them on the event. That's what I want to know is what they're spending it on. Well, I know we had Joanne Lamar here for a while, and uh, we can we can certainly uh, ask the chairwoman uh, what's uh, where all the money's going. Did I miss this? It was an email that came out to us. No, no, it's it hasn't been. I mean, it's we're publicizing the event um, right now on on our website and our Facebook page. And let me just see here. Well, so, don't worry about it now. But okay. I, that, uh, yeah, I'd like to know yeah, what they're October, going to spend five thousand dollars in four hours on. Yeah, well, there's we're going to have uh, this year's event will feature speaker Natalie Jacob from Green Living Science, student artwork, educational presentations from Friends of the Rouge. I think a lot of that is passed through to them. Friends of Miller Woods, Plymouth Pollinators, Gray's Greenhouse, Trailwood Garden Club, Environmental Interpretive Center at U of M Dearborn, interactive kids crafts, educational stuff, and more. So that's Sunday, October 9th from noon to three o'clock at the Four Seasons Pavilion. Okay, any other questions for Ginger? Hearing none, I'll need a motion on this. Mr. Supervisor. Mr. Clerk. I move that the Plymouth Township Board of Trustees hereby adopt resolution number 2022-09-13-57, authorizing a finance director to amend budgets for a general fund for $134,900 and ARPA funds of $543,600 to appropriate funds balance for all funds requested in the amount of $678,500 to recognize the general fund revenue in the amount of $25,000 and to recognize ARPA fund revenue in the amount of $268,600 to the account as outlined in the attached. Second. Okay, motion is made by Clerk Vorba, seconded by Trustee Monaghan. Before we vote, I have another question. Yep. The $90,000 that's going to the court, Yep. that's a new thing. Pretty, pretty yeah. monumental. I want to hear is. some discussion about it. Huge. Well, the court is game. running a deficit now, and um, that is, uh, the court tells us that that is because we are not writing enough tickets. Uh, and of course, as we know, the district court uh, works for five different municipalities, Plymouth, Canton, Northville, and Northville City, and, and Plymouth City. Um, and they've done, uh, I know Ginger is on their finance committee. Uh, I'm the member rep to the committee, and Bob is my alternate. Um, we continue to work with them to reduce expenditures and cut costs, but I, I will tell you, I think that they're very, they've, they've done a great deal of cost cutting already. Um, and I think, frankly, they're, they're, digging now into their into their reserves that I think should be going towards things like OPEB, for example. Um, but it's I, I think it's more of a sign of the times. Um, the the cost of, of doing business is is going up for all of us due to inflation and other factors. And at the same time the number of tickets being written is going down. And this started with COVID when we just had fewer people out on the street doing bad things. Um, but the, the pattern continues, and you know there's. Uh, I, I think it's also just a reflection on 
on how law enforcement is being um, is problem being, is, okay. is, is being is being um, um, applied in this day and age in the five communities. And uh, there has been, I think that there's just, just different attitudes on law enforcement and uh, community policing and how, how tickets are issued and when and arrests. arrests. Uh, so it's, um, it's definitely a, a different world than what we've encountered just five years ago. We don't have any leverage over them. We just cajole them to reduce costs. We, that's really all the best that we can do. Now, there has been some discussion about um, bringing in the uh, Supreme Court, State Court Administrative Office, the SCAO, which is sort of the, the governing jurisdictional body of all, all the courts. Um, I'm not really a fan of that. I, I'm, I'm all for more discussion, but SCAO, in my opinion, works for the courts, so I don't think they're going to be taking our side. Um, but uh, they, they, they've, they've been asked to come in and uh, make some recommendations, and we're all just waiting to see what that's going to look like. But um, it's, really, it's really more of a, a cultural shift in the, in the uh, administration of justice in the five communities. Or throughout the state. Throughout the state. Nation. I mean, we are, now like Ginger will show you later, we're saving money in, in, this, in our jail budget, okay? Because under, under the new state law, which I did not vote for and it never came up under my watch, but the new state law is basically, I, I call it catch and release. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not holding the accused overnight like we used to. We're not holding them for a, a serious period of time unless they present a, a threat to themselves or to others. But that's a case where we are not, uh, we, by state law, we are not um, bringing people in to the volume that we used to. At, at the same time... You mean if the, we catch people that have an outstanding warrant, we're not putting them in jail? We're not holding them overnight or anything like that. We're basically you're you're basically released on your own recognizance at that point. And this is the April 2021 effective correct law change. Yes. Yep. Well, so then. it's a different environment, and then we also, you know, the other factor is um, we are we are a radically different district court system than where we were 20 years ago. Um, we now are in a situation where Canton Township is a city of 100,000 people and uh, with, with shopping and, and uh, you know, it's a much larger community than it used to be. And so as a result, they, they really dominate the, the discussion. But they're not writing tickets. Um, no, none of us are writing tickets the way we used to. Uh, I would say Canton is, we're, we're all moving up, but I, I th in my opinion, again, I think Canton is probably uh, lagging proportionately. Well, the court has the data, right? They can tell oh, yeah. us. We, and I share it. Yeah, you I give you guys that data us. every month yeah. as soon as it comes yeah. out. So so, it, so we, we, we extend an additional 90000 this year yeah. to help them. What do we do if the same situation presents next year? It will. Yeah, it will, and there will be, be more money. There will be okay. more money to the court. Well, but, I mean, at some point, but at some point, there's got to be some accountability, and the business has to be uprighted. It's a business. Indeed, um, and and up until COVID hit and and the political structure here changed, um, we were we were making a profit. We were actually the court actually returned revenues to the to the townships and the cities. Um, COVID stopped all that, and it, we never recovered. We never came back to those pre-COVID numbers. Uh, maybe we will someday. I'm not quite sure if the if all the communities are going to make that a goal. Well, there's less, there's less miles driven with 25 to 30% of the people at home working. Yeah. So the, the number of people on the road is less. They might disagree on Ann Arbor Road <laughs> right nowadays, but you know, oh. but yeah, there's, I mean, I, that's an argument to be made, but I, I think a lot of it has to do with just oh. how policing is, is done right now in this country. Okay, we have a um, motion, yeah, motion and a second. Right. Yep. Um, Take the roll. Uh, Clerk Forba, yes. Trustee Kermy? No. Trustee Buckley? Yes. Trustee Monahan? Yes. Treasurer Dorshevitz? Yes. Trustee Stewart? Yes. Supervisor Heisey? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, uh, I don't know what the pleasure of the board is. You want to take a break or we just yeah, want to keep like plowing ahead? More. Five oh. minute. Five minute break? Okay. Five minute, yeah. That Thank gives the uh, police and fire a chance to set up and we'll keep you on ice a couple more minutes. Start a few fires or something. Yeah.
Don't start a fire. Start a fire. Mm. Turn your mics off, please. It already happened. Yeah, it's over. It's over. It started at six. Yeah, it started at six. Neighbor, two doors away, is a Royal Oak Copy. 
and he stood right there. And, and uh, at the, by the side of the cop. And, and I said, okay, I'll wait for the firefighters from Plymouth Township. But Pap Key, he said. Control safer than No. Look at that house off And I hear you're coming next Wednesday. Yeah, I, hear that stuff. I hear you're coming next Wednesday. So they're at Orton. Homeowners Association. Okay, gotcha. Like one Homeowners Association. There we go. Yeah, or not. Yeah. Good. All right. Presentation mode. Uh, yes. Good. Okay, thank you. All right. No worries. I think we're all here. October. Yeah. All right. October, yeah, the, the Sunday after yeah. 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 Okay, we're back. Let's um, roll. Are we on TV? Do we know if we're on TV? I'm, assuming, on TV. I'm assuming we're on TV. We're on TV. Okay. All right, so we're back, and uh, we're going to start with the uh, police and fire budgets tonight. This is our, our uh, largest part of the township budget. And uh, we have Ginger will we'll kick us off uh, as needed. And then we have, we'll start with the fire department and then obviously the police. And, uh, you know, tonight is, is kind of unique because we have uh, two new chiefs. We have a new assistant police chief. And then uh, I know uh, AC Kudra has done this before, but uh, he's, uh, he's a, a, good, a good role model in this budget presentation process. He's, he's very familiar with it. And I just want all of us to, you know, let's let's be uh, mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, it's not we, we're not trying to zing you guys or play gotcha or anything like that. And and so if we don't know the answer, we don't know the answer. And if we do, we'll we'll do our best to get that information to you. So I know Ginger has spent uh, countless hours on this. You know, state law says that I have to have a draft budget to the board by September first. But I can tell you that this budget is probably you know ninety nine percent done already. Uh, thanks to all the work that Ginger has put into this over the summer, working with the administration and working with all the department heads as well. We, we do this in a very detailed and transparent manner. And so uh, without further ado, we will start with the public safety budgets. Ginger. Thank you. Um, tonight we'll be outlining the public safety's 2023 all fund proposed budget of $12.9 we will begin with the public, public safety's general fund budget of $12.3 million, which includes the individual department budgets, notes payables for their financed equipment, and their use of the one-time OPEP contribution of approximately $189,000 budgeted as a whole in the township's general operating department of the general fund. You'll be presented with the use of other fund sources available in the approximate amount of $659,000 during the fire and emergency department presentation by Chief Connolly, and then again during the police department budget requests being presented by Chief Knightley. I will then wrap up the presentation with an overall public safety budget that reflects the funding sources available for use and the funding uses or expenditures that are being requested for the operations. We will begin the presentation now with Fire Chief Patrick, Con Patrick Connolly. Good evening. Um, in front of you is our 2023 fire department budget. Uh, just a quick overview, the department size, we have um, 24 frontline personnel that's divided amongst 15 firefighters, six lieutenants, three battalion chiefs. In addition to that, in the front office, we have one inspector, one administrative assistant, and myself, the fire chief. In 2021, we um, did 3,246 calls which was a uh, 367 calls over the 2020 run volume. And that amounts to about 8.89 calls a day. Um, to, as of today, we're at 2,450 calls uh, year to date. So we're on track for roughly 3,500 calls for this year, um, which is about, uh, about 250 call increase over 21. Um, that amounts to about 9.57 calls per day. Next slide, please. He's already. No, he's already. Um, so the fiscal year 2023 fire department budget includes uh, the general fire fund and emergency management fund proposed of $5,271,600. The fiscal year 2023 ARPA fund fire department proposed budget of three hundred twenty. 
$5,000 for the new ambulance. Um, the township revolving fund proposed budget of $20,000, which will be for building, for building repairs. And um, the total budget will be $5,589,100. So what is your format here? Are you going to want questions on the page? Um, maybe kind of at the end, if we could kind of work that way or, yeah. At the end of the fire portion. Yeah. And they'll be I've there. got one page that kind of has all my capital and, and I've broke everything out, so. Um, this is the overall pie chart of the whole budget. Um, the green, the, um, the kind of yellow green, the dark yellow and the maroon are all the personnel portion. Even the, the greener, light blue, darker blue, and then the little wedge up at the top. Um, the little wedge is the $25,000 to the general fund reserve. Um, the blue, the, the darker blue is the um, debt service, the $113,100 for the annual payment for the ladder truck. And then we have a capital outlay um, of $183,700. I'll discuss that on the following slide. And then, um, which leaves uh, $524,200 for operations, supplies, repairs, fuel, utilities, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, so the majority of the capital improvements are to station one. Um, station one is with this facility. It was built in 2006. It's um, 16 years old now. Uh, it has the original carpet and paint, the original furnaces, um, the water heater was just replaced last week. Um, it uh, 16 years old. The typical water heater lasts about 12 years. It was pretty bad shape. It was good we got it replaced because it was really corroded. Um, and the additional money will go to carpet and paint, which are both original from uh, 2006. And the um, HVAC units on top have approximately 15 year life, so we're already kind of getting into our power and time with those. Next slide, please. Um, here we have our 2023 major purchases. On the top left, we have the, um, the 2023 Lifeline Ambulance. On the right, we have the power load cot, the, the ambulance cot, the power load system. The bottom right is the Lifetime 15 cardiac monitor. On the bottom left is the Lucas 3 CPR unit. And then the very uh, bottom left is the um, graph video laryngoscopes. Um, these will allow us, most of these purchases, when we, when an ambulance would go out of service, we had to take the equipment off that ambulance and put on another ambulance. We never had a true reserve ambulance, so we always have to take stuff off another ambulance and put it in service. This will allow us to have a fully reserve ambulance at all times. Next slide. We go on our status contracts. Um, this year we're in contract with uh, Ailers um, for our HVAC services for approximately $2,900. And um, we have a contract with, with Strike Medical. That's all our, our medical equipment from them. That's the counts, the power load units, and the ambulances, um, our life packs, and our Lucas 3 CPR devices. And finally, we have a um, contract with uh, Apollo Fire Equipment. They come out every year and they maintain our air packs. Um, they go through them, they have to be checked and calibrated every year on all the air packs and masks. Um, it's pretty much the majority of it now. It's our mission statement. Um, mission of the Plymouth Housing Fire Department is to ensure the protection of life and property, providing fire suppression, rescue operations, paramedic services, hazardous materials, response, emergency management service, environmental, emergency mitigation, and fire investigations. Any questions? Any other budget follow-up on fire at this point, or no? Um, I don't have a question. So then we'll open it up for questions at this time for fire. Okay. John? One, when is your open house? Two, what are you doing to educate the public? I would like, I feel for you having to sit over there during our board meeting. <laughs> I, I'd like to be, you to be more proactive and talk to us about, for instance, February. Snow, falls, heart attacks. 
And, and three, what are you doing for physical exercise, for fitness, for your firefighters? Three questions. Okay. One, Open house is October 8th, I believe. Saturday? Saturday, October 8th from 10 to 3. 10 to, I'm sorry, 10 to 2. Um, second question. And, and you're, you're going to have the dummy over there. I will bring the dummy out this year. Sure. Yeah. Out, they can be pulled out of a car with a forearm. Um, probably not. <laughs> no, no, do it the old fashioned way. Number two, educating the public. Um, that's I'm part of the fire safety open house. We, um, we keep. So, John, let me speak to that as well. I mean, there's going to be a ton of educational opportunities at the open house. There is every year. But the fire department gives us, gives Sue, tons of information that she puts in the um, in the news in the e-news uh, we do get information uh, more I mean, than we well we, we do quite a bit I think every at least every month we have at least one fire and then at least one police related safety issue or something along those lines they also do the blood drive uh, uh, at least quarterly it seems um, and and other outreach you know opportunities that they get um, certainly over the during COVID, you know, we were out there administering uh, flu shots to seniors and and businesses and others. So, uh, you know, we, we're certain the fire department's certainly out in the community okay. doing their best. My point is this: budget night, police and fire are seventy percent of our budget. I want to hear more from them, and I'm very thankful for you. Yes, the other issue was uh, was health of and exercise of the firefighters. I. We have uh, exercise equipment in the stations. They they use it. Quite a few of them use it daily. You might see guys running around outside. You might see them. They've got the big tires. They flip up. That's a big thing they do. I uh, just like to see you encourage them. I have seen battalion chiefs. Uh, forgive me. His name is the battalion chief. I have three. Read off their names. Uh, Matt, Carol, and Fox. Carol. He walks after he has his meal at five o'clock, and he's still on duty. If he's not calling, he's walking. We, so we have guys do that all the time. We have guys running around the station. I used to run around station three around the parking lot in the okay. three I'm all four. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the chief? Yeah. Or Ginger? Uh, right up here, Post State Station One. Um, this year too, we're going to be partnering with the police department somewhat. But I believe Chief Nightel will. Elaborate a little bit more. Uh, it's using on the website. We we okay. start we start promoting that we'll start promoting it probably next week. It's it is October eighth, so we do have a little time. Um, we've got we got a lot of events going on, both in township sponsored and and some of our allied organizations. We have a lot going on uh, in the month. We have the we have the fall colors event. Uh, I mean, I have a list of things right now. Like the the we have a seminar on senior scams that's coming up this month. We have the senior picnic tomorrow. Um, a lot of stuff going on. So we we'll, we do get the word out, and I we've always traditionally had a had a great turnout. So year year over year, what's your request um, from twenty two to twenty three and twenty four in terms of the. In the total on that. I, I can't read. I can't. I left my other um, document at home. Is that the 1.8% that you're talking about? I think yeah, so. Yeah, what's the total budget? Over the year? Well, we'll get into that when we come to the safety presentation. When we look at the whole budget safety presentation, I actually have a slide from 2019 to 2024 that will demonstrate okay. um, each of the department and the public safety sector and what their year over year requests are. And yeah, it's broken down by budget okay. category. So we, we will get there. On uh, 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 the, uh, the fire department's budget on page 210, you could see the, the, the 2022 projected budget and the amended budget, as well as the 23 request and the 24 request. The, uh, the general fund budget is actually decreasing 85,500 this year. Their budget request is going down 1.7 compared to last year's request based on the amended budget. Now the amended budget was as of the date that the uh, packet was provided to you. That does not include the budget amendments that we just did this evening because I can't incorporate those into the budget until we actually have a resolution by the board giving me permission to do that. Okay, any other questions for the chief? Um, you have a service agreement with Taylor's. 
the chief building official, McDonald, was working on some type of Jerry, I know you and I have talked about this, uh, preferred supplier of services. And so how does that dovetail with what McDonald is doing? Uh, it, the recommendation came from Ken just to contact them. And, um, my, I have uh, one, one of my battalion chiefs, Chief Fox, um, shopped around and got us some good prices on the stuff. So wait a minute, who did the So McDonald recommended Ehlers? Yes, and they, they kind of dovetailed with what we we're getting for the bids. So you don't have an actual contract. You have an agreed per hour price. No, it's, it's a service contract. To, as you suggested, to maintain the equipment, the filters, go through the. They do a AC check. They do a um, heating check every year before you know the season kicks in. Okay, who's um, signed the contract? Well, we don't have the contract yet. So I don't know if we have oh, it yet. It's not signed yet. No, it's, it's, this is proposed for next year. The recommendation from Ken McDonald, the building director, was that we have preferred contracts with various vendors so that he's not always having to reinvent the wheel all the time. So, so his recommendation, as I understand it, is Ehlers. Um, they, they are familiar with our systems. I, I think one of the big problems that we've had with our HVAC system at, in this building over the last six years has been lack of regular maintenance and uh, inspection and cleaning and things like that. And uh, I think that over the last two years, we've done a much better job of addressing those issues and we've had fewer, fewer breakdowns, fewer breakdowns, yeah. And this is gonna bring we're us in, moving in a, the same We're plan. moving in a good trajectory. I think we're, I think the worst so is over. This building will be serviced by Ehlers also? I believe so, yeah. Even though because we've had a commercial, this is more of a commercial system compared with fire stations, Correct. which is more residential-like. Well, the well two, this yeah. station and Station 2 both have commercial units on the roofs. Yeah. Station 3 has residential stuff. You know, I've seen invoices for $250 to change a filter. Right. That's why we got the contract with her. We're looking at the contract. It's labor and equipment and, and uh, uh, labor equipment and material. Tell us about your overtime, 2020, 20, 2021, 2022, 2023. Your overtime budget and how are you going to perform it? Um, this year we're keeping on track. I do have one personnel on long-term disability, which does not help. So that keeps, but uh, we're pretty close on track for being in budget this year. Um, I can't really tell you off the top of my head for the years previous. What's the magnitude of our annual overtime budget? What's the size? Is it a hundred thousand or is it five hundred thousand? No, it's uh, one thirty-one. I have to look and see exactly. The current twenty twenty-two amended budget for overtime in the, in the fire department is one hundred and thirty thousand. What was it in twenty twenty-one? Ninety-one thousand three hundred was the actual. I don't have the uh, original adopted budget. I only have the actual expenditures. So it's way up from ninety-one thousand to one hundred thirty. The budgeted amount as a percentage. So you're comparing budgeted amount to actual huh. expended yeah. amount. So it's not. Right. So it's, it's not. We don't know if. It's, yes, it is going well, the from ninety-one amount to one hundred thirty. It's, it's on slide two hundred eight. Okay, that does. Uh, the budgeted amount is is higher than than the actual yeah. expended right. amount from last year. So. Yeah. We also have. Less. We also have a. F no. A we, we intend to spend more. We. One hundred thirty-five thousand in twenty twenty-three. Twenty twenty-one actual was ninety-one. The twenty twenty-one actual overtime expenditure was ninety-one thousand three hundred. Okay. The fiscal year twenty twenty-two amended budget is one hundred and thirty. The okay. fiscal year twenty-three requested overtime budget is one one hundred. And twenty-seven thousand five hundred. It's found on page two hundred eight of your packet. What page, Ginger? Two hundred eight. I was just trying to find it. One of the challenges that we have, and I, I, I don't want to violate HIPAA regulations or anything, but we do have a, a firefighter who is on a long-term extended disability. Uh, although he's um, he's definitely, we think he's improving, and we're, we hope and pray that he can come back to work as soon as possible. So that's what you attribute 2021 up 
It's 20, a factor. 22 up. 20, 22 it's, a fa up. it's a factor. It's certainly not the only one. But we've also had firefighters out with COVID and other, you know, COVID has definitely taken a bite out of both departments. Let's talk about the revenue side with um, transports. Tell us about that. Um, year to date, I believe. Do you have more agenda? Um, I'm addressing that the public safety budget is part of the revenue sources. The budget for 23 is projected at 200,000. Transports are actually up, I believe, at the, the failure of our contract vendor being able to provide these services, which have increased the number of runs that the fire department's making. What is the trend of that, Chief? We keep going up. We keep, we keep transporting more so patients. So HVA still has not been able to reestablish itself from pre-COVID? Yes. They, we, we keep transporting more and more. Um, we went from, I have the numbers, from 2020, which is kind of an off year because of COVID, um, but if you take 2019, kind of throw 2020 out just because of COVID, we were at 340 transports. In 2021, we were 507, which was a 247 increase. I'm sorry, that's over 2020, but yeah. So it's in, then this year we're on track to increase probably that amount again. I think, uh, yeah. In 2021, we realized $191,600 in revenue due to ambulance transports. The current year budget is projected at 195, and the budget for 2023 is 200,000. So we're still trading it upward. But what are you doing to encourage HVA to come up to speed? How often do you speak with them or meet in person? They're, they're supposed to give me a report every month. We haven't heard as it, as it goes. They can't find people. Nobody can find people in this in this field. They're not giving a report each month. I'm not getting them. Uh, the supervisor gets some of that. So. Well, uh, no, we need to check the contract because yeah. yeah. if they're not responding like that, then we should we should count, call them out on that. Yeah, we need to ask them where. But it's it's, it's the trend in this field. There are not people to staff ambulances. It's a scary time in our society right now. There are not people to staff ambulances currently. This is all over the country. And, and I also believe that the corporate framework of HVA has changed considerably over the last two years. They're now basically been, uh, controlled by uh, out of Grand Rapids. Yes. Um, I think Ann Arbor is their, one of their, and Plymouth City are they, they their merged last with major Life Care out of Battle Creek. Pardon me? They I'm merged with a company Life Care out of Battle Jeff. Creek. Okay, what were you gonna say? I was just saying that's what they merged with. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't hear okay, what so, you said. So their corporate structure has moved primarily to the west side of the state. I, I think, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have the presence or um, involvement in Southeast Michigan like they did even a couple of years ago. A lot of the people, a lot of the people that we dealt with, people who we executed that contract with back a few years ago, they're all gone. They've mm -hmm. been they've been sacked. So uh, it's Are they they're still a nonprofit. They merged with somebody. I don't know. I am. Assuming I believe they're, that they're still, still a nonprofit. Still a nonprofit. Yeah, but they're they've and I did they, were they merged or the, did they were they, they acquired? They come under the umbrella of emergent health. Partners, yeah. I believe, that's and, and that's. I'm not. I don't want to debate that tonight. I mean, I. I think there's. Yeah, a time, I'd say they're necessary at least to have something. There, you look at time North Little Township has nothing. There, there's a time and place for that, and and I think you know, we're going to have our goals list in in the January. We can we can noodle it around at that point. Okay. Anything else for Chief Connolly? Any ideas for cost reduction? Do you have a cost reduction list? Opportunities. Uh, I'm constantly looking at that. I, you don't have a list. I don't have a list, but I do have. I'd encourage you to make a list. It tends to be something when you. Well, write I, it down. I have lists, many lists of cost <laughs> reduction. I'm talking about the, I don't have, yeah. the opportunities list, list. list for cost reduction, and then you also have a, a list we, for risk where you may go over. Actually, this next month, my my October officer meeting is my strategic planning meeting. That's when we will be discussing that amongst my senior leadership and in October and April are going to be our strategic planning meetings. Okay. Right. So I take the opportunity to say, thank Ginger and Carol for all their help being very patient with me my first time. <laughs> and thank you board. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Don't go away now. You have to still stay for the whole thing. All right, now we have the police. So this is Chief Nitel's first budget with us, but as we know, he has uh, done this kind of thing before in many other capacities. So we, we are confident that he will do a wonderful job as always. I just want to say too, Chief, you, you've just done a terrific job for us in the last, since you came on board. Um, responsive, on top of things, uh, very informative. Um, really, we're, we're thrilled to have you. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, boss. I appreciate that. Uh, and I'd like to start by, uh, by, by saying what a thrill it is for me to be sitting in this position and, and to have the job that I have. I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky. Uh, and every day I come to work, I try to do the best I can for the citizens of Plymouth Township. So uh, thank you, sir. Um, if we could flip to the first thank you, uh, organizational chart. To give you uh, an idea of the makeup of the police department, myself, Assistant Chief Kudra, uh, Lieutenant Krebs is our lieutenant in charge of the patrol division. We, have, we are on 12-hour shifts. For our police officers, uh, our dispatchers are on eight-hour shifts. Uh, each of our four platoons has a sergeant and four police officers. In dispatch, uh, they are in eight-hour shifts. We have a, uh, Cindy Fell is Cindy Fell is our uh, dispatch supervisor, and uh, she has eleven dispatchers that uh, work with her. Uh, from this organization chart, you can see that. Uh, we are recommending in this budget this year to add the position of a school resource officer. Uh, that would be an additional position to what we had uh, last year. If you could go to the next slide, please. Going through the duties of a school resource officer and the, uh, the need for a school resource officer in Plymouth Township. Uh, these, uh, what we've done is listed some of the areas that and responsibilities that will fall onto the school resource officer. Uh, I look at this uh, position as uh, uh, an officer that would lead a lot of what goes on, but we would also have other officers in the department that would be assisting with our schools. Uh, security assessments would be an area we would look, uh, this would primarily happen uh, during the summertime. We would look at the access control systems for all of our schools, uh, video capabilities, uh, and uh, police and fire access into all the buildings. Uh, our uh, public schools at Plymouth Canton uh, are very specific on access, but we have a lot of different private uh, charter schools uh, and there are different ways to access these buildings. So this would be uh, one of the strategies for this uh, position. Uh, the position would also investigate uh, student-related safety and uh, criminal uh, concerns. This officer would be a team officer. Team, uh, what that stands for is uh, similar to the old DARE program, but it stands for teaching, educating, and mentoring. Uh, and this is an opportunity for our officers to be out with the school children and to build trust and rapport with the school children. Uh, safety programs and presentations to students, staff, and faculty. These would, would include drug and alcohol presentations uh, as our, uh, our uh, middle schoolers get closer to driving. Uh, what happens when they get stopped by a police officer? What, you know, a lot of times, my daughter went through this, unfortunately, uh, it can be a very traumatic experience, so we can walk through that. Um, also, uh, with social media, what are the do's and don'ts when it comes to social media? So uh, we'll look at that as well uh, and give presentations. Uh, they will be ALICE instructors. All of the uh, current uh, school resource officers are ALICE instructors. ALICE, um, the, uh, what it stands for is alert, lockdown, inform, counter, evac, and evacuate. Uh, instructors. Uh, they will be part of the behavioral threat assessment team. In my uh, previous role at the University of Michigan, I helped build out the behavioral threat assessment team. I met with uh, members of the Punta Cat School District. <laughs> this office will be specifically look at uh, behavioral threat assessment, threat to uh, your schools, to other individuals, and threat to self uh, situations. Uh, they would also be uh, a very important part of this job would be a liaison to school with school administrators and parent uh, teacher organizations. We also bridge the gap with uh, public, private, charter, and Montessori schools uh, as far as when it comes to safety in each of the schools. Uh, and we will also uh, look to have this person coordinate, uh, this officer coordinate uh, our uh, community outreach programs uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later, but they will also be involved uh, heavily in those. So including the um, charter schools and the private schools, what are there probably about a dozen schools in Plymouth Township? Eleven, yes. Eleven. I have the number, yes. How do they spread their time 
or allocate their time. So we would look for the uh, you know, part of the process would be developing an MOU with the school district, uh, having uh, a office uh, in in one of the schools that they could function from, and then they would uh, be uh, the responsibilities as I explained would be built out for each of the schools, and they would move around to each of the schools. The goal would be that that school resource officer would have contact, whether it be a presentation, whether it be a public forum with each student. Each of, in each of our uh, Plymouth Township public schools, or schools in general. And what's an MOU? Um, it's a um, memorandum of understanding. Of understanding. Contract. Contract. Chief, the Northfield Township has made a big deal about the fact that they got keys to the schools. Um, and it's been touted in the media and everything like that. I mean, I'm not questioning whether or not that's a good idea, but is that something that we would be looking at as well for the schools? In that, the township? Yeah, that's correct. So we're working with uh, Josh Meyer, who's uh, the director of uh, uh, the, the security for the school district. Yeah. And our, our uh, FOB system you know, that we have for this building, yeah. uh, what we're looking at is a system where our, our officers can get into those schools using the same FOB. Wow. Uh, that's what's Canton. Canton is going to that right now. Uh, the issue that we have, and that's why when I talk about bridging the gap with the other schools is, each of the other schools is a little bit different. So we really have to, the school resource officer has to really educate all of our police officers on if we have a run at this particular school. And the firefighters, the same thing. How do we get into that school as quickly as possible? Yeah, the Canton, the high schools are obviously all in Canton. So do we, uh, although really nowadays, I mean, the threat can be anywhere, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do, what, what kind of coordination do we have then with Canton Township with respect to the high schools? I know when we had the incident last year, or earlier this year, we were all hands on deck. So what, what kind of, what role do we play in the high school in the park, at the park complex? I, I think we play a very important role okay. because we have, uh, we have a lot of our uh, Plymouth Township uh, students are in, in all three of those schools. Uh, our role specifically, uh, I was not here on that date, but I've been through debriefs uh, of that. And earlier uh, in August, uh, we had active shooter training. We work with uh, the city of Plymouth and with Canton. Uh, the uh, emergency manager in Canton uh, orchestrated all the training. Myself and the assistant chief sat through a tabletop exercise, uh, and it was related to the high school and the incident that uh, hypothetically would happen at the high school and how we do it. Uh, I would foresee uh, our response as an assist response uh, we would part myself, the assistant chief, uh, would be a part of the emergency operations center, very likely. Uh, our officers on the road would be assisting Canton uh, with traffic or different events, depending. Now, they could feasibly be the first ones to, uh, to go to that scene. Uh, and that's why we train together, because if our, uh, one of our cars shows up at the same time Canton, they're trained the, the same method, the same strategy to go in and uh, you know, okay. handle the situation. Does the city of Plymouth have a school resource officer? No, they do not. Okay. Yeah. All right, keep going. Back to the presentation. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is, uh, and uh, thank you again for our partner, um, Ginger here, uh, who helped us put together these uh, pie charts. Uh, as we can see, the uh, wages and salaries, uh, insurance benefits, retirement benefits, and the uh, operational costs are listed on there. Go to the next slide, please, and we'll talk about police uh, purchases, uh, items that we are requesting in this budget. Preliminary breath uh, tests for OWIRS, or PBTs they're called. Uh, two of our uh, systems currently are not functioning that need to be replaced. We're asking for an additional three. Uh, as we talked about earlier, um, with uh, coming out of COVID, uh, we're, we're the feeling is that we're going to be much more uh, um, hands-on as far as arrests and things like that, and that's one of the pieces of equipment that we need when we're investigating OWI or a drunk driver. Uh, weapons cleaning system, 35 we asked for. We want each of our officers uh, having a clean sidearm as well as rifles. It's very important. These uh, uh, cleaning kits will be assigned to each of the officers. A mass casualty kit. Uh, this is uh, something I brought uh, with me. Uh, from my time at the, at the university policing and uh, each of the cars will have a kit in it that has tourniquets, uh, chest seals, and uh, compression bandages for uh, mass casualty situations uh, as we've learned, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately in Iraq 
in Afghanistan that um, tourniquets save lives. So uh, they're one of the most important pieces of equipment that we can carry for police and fire. Uh, lockout kits, uh, having 10, this is so that we can go out and help folks uh, get into their vehicles. Uh, portable hard drives for our detector bureau. Uh, as we all know with technology, um, in our investigations, we're dealing with a lot more uh, computers, cell phones, electronics, and we want to be able to preserve that evidence, so uh, that would help us preserve that evidence for our uh, criminal cases. Mobile Field Force, we are part of the Western Wayne Mobile Field Force Unit, uh, which basically means in the Western Wayne areas, uh, each agency uh, contributed, contributes so many officers to the Mobile Field Force in case we have uh, a riot or some type of civil uh, disturbance. We have three members that are assigned, so we're looking for uh, gas mask, uh, filter canisters, and holsters. Uh, as part of the Special Operations Team, this is Western Wayne County Special Operations Team, which is basically a SWAT unit. Uh, we have two members that are on that unit as well, and again, it's, it's uh, pooling resources. Each of the departments in Western Wayne's uh, contribute officers to this uh, unit. Uh, we are asking for communication equipment. This communication equipment we attach to the radios so that they can talk hands-free uh, during uh, uh, raids and uh, uh, different type of field operations. Uh, police badges. Uh, when I first came here, I had the, opp the great opportunity to meet with each one of my uh, police officers. First month I was here, and uh, one of the uh, central theme came up that uh, they never, most of the officers, including the officers standing next to me, have never had a, a new badge. For, so we haven't replaced badges in over 20 years. Uh, the badge that uh, the assistant chief and I have at the state of Michigan, low uh, uh, order, uh, seal. press and seals. I'm sorry. Uh, have the state of Michigan seal on it, and that's what we want to go to. Our officers right now, so our command officers have this. Our police officers have a shield. Uh, the shield is more of an LA County uh, kind of shield. Yeah. Uh, we want to, um, you know, we want to go be very consistent all the way through the ranks. Uh, and you know, we're asking them to be professional. We want them to look professional. So uh, we felt that this was uh, an important piece to our budget. Uh, the transparency dashboard, our transparency dashboard, this is an item that uh, a lot of police agencies, I would say most in the area, uh, have went to. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, put information out to our public to show exactly what uh, our contacts are uh, day in and day out when it comes to things like arrests and tickets and, and information. And, and I'd just like to add that this is something that we've been very well aware of in the wake of the George Floyd incident. And, and we, as a board, recognize that very quickly. And we have incorporated it every year in our, our goals. And we wanted to make sure that before we embarked on this, that we were going to do it right. And we wanted to, frankly, just kind of watch and see what larger or other communities were doing. So I'm, I'm confident that, that we're on the right path now with this and that we'll be able to satisfy that, that goal of this board that we, uh, that we have that kind of transparency dashboard that I, I think many people are, are certainly looking for. Tell us more about what, what kind of data is on there. So the system uh, links directly in with Clemis, which all of our reports, our tickets, everything goes into Clemis. So we can pull data out as far as uh, you know, um, males, uh, females arrested or ticketed, um, you know, the, uh, any, anything that's checked on the, the tickets or the, in the arrest, you know, can be queried and added on there. So uh, we can be uh, very transparent on what our, what our contacts are. What is Canton Township doing? Uh, are they, they using this? There, I, I would say uh, well, we don't most. Know. Yeah, I would say most uh, agencies in Western Wayne County are using this. Yes. Is it CAN software that's written by Oakland County, or what is it? The data is pulled from the Oakland County Columbus system. Uh, the, um, this is a, uh, a system that ties into that, into the uh, Columbus system, which, keep, which keeps all of our data. So we're going to purchase the software? What is this transparency dashboard? Oh, so so, so the, the transparency dashboard, I want to make sure I tell you the right company. <laughs> the, uh, I'm getting old, I have to take my glasses off to read this. Uh, so this is provided by a company, um, Tyler Technologies. Tyler. And so Tyler Technologies is a third party vendor. And uh, the way we would promote transparency is by using this third party vendor who would pull our data from the clinics. So we're not providing the data that's going into the transparency dashboard. We're, we're hiring this third party vendor to 
set up a system where we can determine what do we want to show. Do we want to show citations? We can show uh, verbal warnings, uh, and we can break that down by age, race, sex, whatever we choose uh, as far as that goes. And they pull that information no, we don't touch the out of Clemens without us having yeah. our hands on it. And that kind of fosters that transparency. Exactly. That we're looking for. But so it's an arm's length track. kind of thing. Yeah. Arm's length right. with so a third party. Yes. And who monitors the quality of this third party? Island Technologies is a, it's a big, it's a huge company. Yeah. Right, but who monitors their quality? Some of their systems are good, and some of them are. Yep, you're helping right. me out. So, 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 so Tyler, Tyler Technologies. You don't want any mistakes. Tyler Technologies, it, it, you know, as I've gone to the Chiefs conferences and I've talked to other agencies who have transparency dashboards, I've spoken to the City of Plymouth, Westland, Canton, Livonia. Tyler Technologies is, is kind of the leader in this area. And that is the company that most agencies that I have spoken to use. I've had interactions with them at uh, various different conferences. So, so they're extracting the data. They're, they're they are extracting our our data from Clemens, and and they get the data from Clemens. But what it, what it, what underlying data exists in Clemens? Uh, there, there's demographic data. So there's demographic data. Ticket? Yep. So so if I write a ticket, on the ticket to somebody. Uh, that's going to have, you know, their date of birth, which you can get their age from. It's going to have their uh, race, their sex, um, you know, everything that you would want to have on that transparency. How do you determine somebody's race when you write a ticket? Uh, so there's uh, codes that you put in there. There's what? But, uh, but I mean, codes. who codes. makes that judgment? What if somebody's biracial? You, you well, there's a box to check for unknown. Judgment yeah. of the officer in the That's field. That's judgment of the officer. They try oh, to be as detailed as they can, but you know, yeah, sure. on the side of the road, sometimes you just, you know. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I like the fact that it's the third party vendor because there's, you, you, it's kind of like evidence. You know, you, you want to have a, a clean chain of evidence. And so uh, it's good that we're not directly touching that because then you, you won't be accused of manipulating the data. Exactly. So. That's what And I as we all know, I mean, Clemis is the, the Oakland County. Crime database, which we've been, which everybody in Southeast Michigan has been using now for probably third, at least thirty years. Maybe we've used it ever since I've thirty or forty years. years. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's move on. Right. What was the last one? We didn't cover that. Oh, and the last one is the Guardian Tracking uh, Program. Uh, this was a recommendation, um, and uh, we are in the process. We're on the final stages of. Uh, receiving our accreditation. We are, myself and the assistant chief and our accreditation team will be going in front of the board tomorrow uh, at two o'clock uh, and they will make their final decision. So by three o'clock, we should have a decision on that. One of the recommendations is to have this guarding tracking program and what it will do is it will house the uh, all the training from the department. It'll uh, be a position to house all the um, evaluations and early warning tracking system. And the early warning a uh, tracking system is for uh, if we're having any type of employee issues. If we have a, for example, an officer that's uh, that uh, supervisor is noted as maybe driving the car too fast, and, you know, too many times, uh, or if we have use of force issues with a particular officer, uh, the the uh, early warning system will identify that to the supervisor and will go up the chain, and uh, the issue will be addressed. So, uh, and that's uh, final. No. Next page. Uh, the next page is the uh, forfeiture funds available, and that'll be of, uh, as of uh, 2023, including the purchases that uh, were already approved uh, for this year for 2022. Before you leave that, mm -hmm. uh, one time we were talking earlier this year that we would have over a million dollars, a million to a million five in the forfeiture fund. What's happened or what are we looking at here? Ginger, do you want to try that one? So for 2022, <coughs> we have proposed budget uh, for a use of the fund balances from the three drug law funds in the amount of $324,900. At the end of our audit, which was December 31st of 2021, the total fund balance of all three drug law funds was $619,061. 
So with the expected use this year of $324,900, you're looking at a total of $411,661 remaining in the fund balance, assuming we get no additional revenues between today and December 31st that are available to fund the 2023 requested budgets. Okay, well, we were expecting a large inflow this year, so that did not happen yet. Uh, we've actually I was told this by a township employee that was in the police department. Yeah, we, so. We've only received $117,500 so far this year. $115,000 of that is in the drug forfeiture fund, and part of that is also a result of proceeds received as a result of sale of vehicles. So uh, I believe we received $97,000 from the drug, fall, drug fund. Uh, again, these cases are pending, and they're all based on litigation and settlement. So we don't realize the revenue, which I actually talk about in my slide, until uh, we actually receive it. Until we have cash in hand. We, and I, I guess I can comment on that from my time, uh, 10 years with DEA, is there... Uh, the, uh, the wheels of justice at the federal level when it comes to forfeiture are very, very slow. And, uh, you know, we have uh, some of these seizures dating back uh, eight, nine years that are still in the, in the uh, judicial stages. So, But the fact that we have the relationship with Homeland Security here at the township and we have an officer assigned to their detail uh, puts us in a very advantageous position for, um, for potential revenue. Revenue, uh, drug forfeiture revenue. Yeah. We, you know, we had a meet. Bob, were you at that meeting with us? At I was Homeland, at Homeland Security. Yeah. You know, and we were. We we we've, we've always had. We have this discussion every year about. You know, are being are those drug revenues? Drug. Yeah, we, being addicted. Bob to always drugs. says we're addicted to drugs, but um, <laughs> drug money. The drug money. Um, and and we had we posed that very question to them at that time because with the legalization of marijuana, we always thought that these revenues would go down. But as they pointed out. If anything, you know, everybody's trying to get that, that go higher, literally. And so now with fentanyl and cocaine and, and all the other drugs that are out there that are still illegal, the, the, they're probably busier now than they were um, before, you know, when, when marijuana was legal. And you combine that again with federal policies of open borders and people, you know, coming into this country with drugs, um, you know, it's, um, it's a much more serious problem than where, what, where we were two years ago. Yeah, and I would say, too, that those resources that were traditionally uh, went to marijuana investigations are now at heroin and cocaine, which, which are uh, the seizures for those and the, uh, the forfeiture money that come in for those are, are generally very significant. So uh, I can also comment that our Homeland Security uh, officer who's been there, you know, just within the last, uh, since I've been here in the last four months, uh, you know, we had, they have brought in seizures, so they're, uh, they're doing very well in my eyes. Uh, I've met, uh, as uh, Mr. Heisey said, we've met with uh, command there. I've been downtown, uh, met with the uh, associate uh, special agent in charge. Uh, I've also met uh, within the last month with the DEA um, assistant special agent in charge uh, that supervises our task force officer as well as the group supervisor. So uh, they're uh, uh, very accessible. And uh, we have a lot of meetings with them and, and have these discussions. So. Okay. okay, any other questions on that? Now we're moving on to the forfeiture fund purchases. Okay, very good. Um, fund purchases that we're recommending uh, for uh, next year. Uh, three Ford uh, Interceptor Utility uh, Patrol vehicles out of the federal uh, account. Uh, one Ford Edge for our Homeland Security Investigations Task Force Officer. Uh, the taser lease agreements uh, would come out of uh, federal for our less lethal tasers. Uh, carpet and paint in the second half of the police building. We are in the uh, finishing stages of the first half of the building. Uh, this would come from the state forfeiture. Uh, the uh, carpet and paint, uh, quite frankly, looks fantastic. Uh, we're still uh, about a week away from getting everything wrapped up, but uh, it really looks professional. It looks outstanding. Wait a minute, you're spending this this year? We, we, did the, uh, we did the administrative side of the building. Uh, dispatch was done in the investigative bureau. Uh, next year, the recommendation for this would be the, the, the back half of the building, which would be uh, patrol, roll call, sergeant's rooms, uh, the whole back half of the building for a carpet and uh, paint. Um, moving on, uh, three mobile uh, prep radios. We don't uh, currently have 
uh, backup radios. If the uh, officer drops radio or radio breaks or it's not working, we have to get it serviced. We don't have backup. So we're, uh, we're requesting three mobile uh, prep radios so that we have that. Uh, and 10 Dell uh, financial computer leases that will come out of our uh, IRS fund. Okay, next slide. Uh, pie chart that was put together again by uh, Ginger, thank you. Uh, it shows our, uh, in the blue, our uh, wages and salaries, insurance and benefits. Uh, this is this is dispatch. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I moved, dispatch yes, I'm sorry, I moved right to dispatch. Uh, dispatch and jail, a combined uh, budget of uh, $1,648,300. The pie chart, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, lists uh, the salaries, insurance, retirement, operations, uh, in the uh, debt service. Uh, next slide. We'll so, to, um, go just, a, just a short circuit. This, uh, this is saying that 87% um, of costs are people-related, right? Yeah. Still a little more. 100 minus Yeah, when you count, if you count retirement benefits. Yeah, yeah that's people-related expense. So that is non-discretionary. These are retirement benefits for active employees only, Ginger? The retirement benefits are retirees only. The insurance benefits are active employees. Wow. So 11% okay. is related to active employees for health care. And the 211,700 or 13% is retiree benefits, which include retiree health care, include pension benefits, and includes um, the 401 re DC retirement. All right, thank you. So the 15% match, where is that on there uh, for active it's in employees? In the retirement benefits. It's in retirement. So it's active, reti active and retired people, Correct. both. Correct. So our $250,000 payment to OPEB is reflected in this or not? Yes. Partially. Partially. This is dispatch. So retirement care. benefits well, here, police and fire. right? Retirement yeah. benefits here include ten thousand dollars in retiree health care premiums and one-time OPEP benefit payments. It includes sixty-nine thousand in DC retirements and one hundred thirty-two thousand in the MERS pension obligation. So of the two fifty sixty some is sixty something is the contribution to OPEP. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, Your general government. That's what you said. The, the OPEB contribution from the general fund this year will, for 2023 is budgeted at 250000 per right. the 19 resolution passed by the board. Right, right. But of that, the allocation towards uh, that, that um, the share that applies to dispatch and jail is 60000 Is that what you said? No, the, the OPEB is 10400 Okay. Thank you. So 7,500 for current uh, retiree health care, and then of the OPEB contribution is $2,900 of the total. Okay, I misheard you. Thank you. There's only one retiree. Yeah. Currently drawing benefits. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, next slide. Thank you. Uh, dispatch uh, jail equipment purchases. Uh, these are uh, what we're requesting. Mobile prep radios for the dispatch center. Uh, the Apex uh, all band uh, consoles, these are backup radio systems, three for each of the three consoles. Um, the Mevo uh, mobile kit, which is a transportable 911 workstation or redundancy in case we have an issue and have to evacuate our building. Uh, and then uh, communication chairs for our three dispatchers, uh, chairs that uh, obviously they spend a majority of their shift sitting in, so uh, they would uh, put, we would put a request in for So that. we recently bought furniture, so. Are these incremental or are they replacements? <clears throat> Help me out with this, uh, Lieutenant. So, so, so the chairs uh, <clears throat> were not part of that furniture purchase that was made. I, I want to say it was 2018, possibly. Um, that was, if you were to go into the dispatch center, that is the consoles that they sit at. Uh, so the, the desks that move up and down so they can either sit or stand. The chairs we've actually had for quite a while and uh, their warranty and, and I can find the actual age of the chairs if you need that. I don't have it for me right now. Uh, but they're, they're several years old. They're older than that, than those consoles. Uh, and their warranty has expired. And we've had the company that we purchased them from come out and fix them several times under warranty. And they're just, 
you know, they're different than the chair in my office in that they are sat in 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So they wear out, I would say, at probably three times the rate of a normal <laughs> office chair. Like my chair in the so, office, my office. These are replacements, not incremental. The they three. The replacements, I would replacements sound, sounds like for the chairs that we have now. All right. Yes. Okay. 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 Next slide. All right, very good. Uh, Plan community outreach. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, an area that's near and dear to all of our hearts here in the uh, Township Police Department. Um, Coffee with a Cop. Uh, this is a program uh, that I've utilized in previous uh, jobs that I've had. It's, a, it's a, a strong way for our police officers to get out into the public, be with our public, hear what they have to say. Uh, second, uh, Houses of Worship Community. This is a, a system that I saw work very effectively in the city of Dearborn. And uh, the goal here would be to bring all of our houses of worship together, have a meeting, talk about what's going on in the township, talk about best practices, talk about um, how can we better secure um, all of our houses of worship. So uh, that would be the second. Third is, a, uh, as we mentioned before, a public safety open house. Uh, Police office, the police department and fire department um, in any city have not always seen eye to eye. Um, what Pat, Chief Connolly, and myself meet very regularly, and uh, we're on the same team. So what we've decided to do next year is we are going to participate in the fire open house this year. Next year it's going to be a public safety open house. So we're going to invite um, ATF, FDI, FBI, MSP, uh, Wayne County Sheriff's Office to come out and uh, show our citizens all the resources that we have here in the township. So state police, state police Michigan State Police, absolutely. Uh, we're gonna have tours of our building. Uh, we're gonna allow our citizens to come in and see what their tax uh, dollar at work. So that's our goal for next year. Run, hide, fight, active assailant program. That's a program we're currently building. And we're gonna roll that out to our businesses in the community. Um, we're gonna have multiple officers on each shift who can deliver this. It'll be a common uh, message for our businesses. Uh, it's unfortunate that we have to think this way, but in, in these days and days, we have to be prepared. And uh, we are going to send out a very uh, common message to our businesses within. And we're also going to start, and we're going to start right here uh, with our township walls. We're going to train all of our departments here. Uh, I've already met with folks at the end of St. John's. They're very interested to have us come out there. Uh, so we're going to go out and, uh, you know, they they'd enjoy uh, this type of training as well. Um, Focusing on our homeowners associations. Uh, if you see something, say something. This is a national program. We've all heard it over the years. Uh, but you know, we're going to get back out. COVID, uh, our uh, contacts with our homeowners associations because of COVID, we kind of backed those down. Uh, we're going to rev those back up and we're going to get back out in our homeowners associations. And uh, we're going to teach uh, if you see say, something, say something. Um, you know, I've said, you've heard me say this before when I was uh, trying to get this job. One of the most frustrating things for police officers to hear is, oh, geez, you know, I saw somebody out in a flashlight looking around last night, but I didn't want to bother you. We want that. We want our citizens to bother us. Let us know what's going on. Uh, it's a for force multiplier for us to have our citizens educated on how to get us the information we need to keep them safe. Um, the uh, Senior Fraud and Financial Exploitation Program. This is uh, a program that we're going to roll out this month, uh, September 22nd. Uh, Tom Champagne is our Homeland Security uh, investigator. Um, task Force officer is going to give the presentation here with his group supervisor from HSI, uh, GS Wallace. Uh, this is a program. It's it's geared towards seniors, but it's really for anybody. If you have a phone or a computer, you can learn something from this training. And uh, it's going to we're going to talk about the ten biggest scams that are going on right now. Uh, they're going to talk about prevention. They're going to talk about what you do if you are a victim of uh, some type of scam. Um, and uh, the last is uh, One Pill Can Kill. This is a, a program that we're going to partner with DEA. I met with the assistant special agents in charge of DEA, and uh, they have a fantastic program that's very educational for parents and for, and for uh, uh, young adults as well uh, about uh, opioids. And, uh, you know, with COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks forgot that we have an opioid problem in this country. And, uh, uh, in, in Plymouth Township, unfortunately, it's not immune to that. So uh, we're going to roll that out uh, and uh, build those programs out. Uh, next slide. Chief, one thing I would oh, like to add is um, we, were, we were going to do it this year, but 
we, we all just, the Chiefs and I decided that we were going to defer this until next year, but I'd like to get back to having a regular annual awards program, a recognition program for police, fire, and dispatch. It doesn't have to be something, a sit-down dinner or anything grandiose, but uh, it's, it should be uh, better than just doing it here, you know, or but maybe not as grandiose as St. John's, unless, of course, they want to donate their facilities to us. <laughs> um, but um, something definitely we want to look at doing next year, and that would probably be like in the fall of, of next year. Yes, sir. And I, you so. know, I, I'll speak for the police officers and I'll speak for the firefighters. I think uh, it would it'd be fantastic to have that and to honor uh, the great work that they're doing every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, next slide. Uh, what uh, are we currently doing for community outreach? Uh, some of our campaigns that we're currently involved in, uh, Christmas uh, to the community. Uh, First Step. First Step is uh, an organization uh, that has advocates um, for uh, survivors of domestic violence, stalking, criminal sexual conduct. And First Step is based, in the Wayne County facility is based in our township. So we've went out to that facility. I've been down to the, uh, the housing facility uh, down in Wayne. Uh, to get a tour of myself and Cindy Felt. Uh, it's a fantastic organization. Uh, we're uh, creating an MOU with them and a policy and procedure to work directly with them. But uh, we are also going to be very um, involved with the Giving Tree uh, as part of that. Uh, annual No Shave uh, November fundraiser. This is one of our uh, officers' favorite. Uh, for, for the month of November, they don't have to shave. So uh, they seek donations. This year, we're going to work, we're going to partner with Wigs for Kids. Uh, that's the uh, organization that we're going to partner with, and we're going to collect money. Um, the officers, uh, like I said, it's, it's one of their, uh, their favorite uh, uh, programs of the year. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, fire department and open house will be very involved with that. Uh, our honor guard. Uh, our honor guard is, is taking leaps and bounds. Uh, I know uh, it's taken a little bit of work, but we work directly with uh, Plymouth City. We have a joint uh, honor guard team. Uh, Tom Champagne is from our department, is the leader of that group. Uh, if you go to the 4th of July parade or if you go to the Memorial Day parade, you'll see uh, that team and be very proud of them. Uh, first Responders Food Drive, we're involved with that. The Little Free Library, which is right out in front of the police building. Uh, the Michigan uh, Foster Care uh, Closet. We're also partnering, um, and I don't have it on here, but I, I wanted to mention it. I'm working with uh, Chief Connolly and uh, we're developing, we have a police chaplain program, we're gonna develop a public safety chaplains program so that we're gonna to work together. And as part of that, uh, House of Worship Committee, we're gonna recruit and see if we can get some more police, uh, police and fire chaplains in that public safety. Uh, next slide, please, unless there's any questions. Uh, budget needs uh, beyond 2023. Uh, patrol vehicles, uh, those are uh, reoccurring. Uh, you know, every year, uh, you know, we're rotating the cars. Uh, replacement of a uh, police server, that's something down the road, uh, working with Bob Jenks, uh, that we're going to uh, eventually have an expense there. Uh, replacing the data switches, replacing the patrol car modems. Uh, these are not right now issues, but these are issues that are down the road. Uh, replacement of ballistic vest, we have a, a ballistic vest uh, that unfortunately there's a shelf life for those, so they, they uh, only last so long, so uh, we'll have to replace that vest or that ballistic vest, ballistic shield, excuse me, um, as part of your needs and beyond. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, yeah, on, on behalf of the men and women of the Plymouth Township uh, Police Department, uh, and I'll, Mr. Yep. Kirby, I know you got a question, but uh, uh -huh. I just want to uh, thank you for your consideration in this budget. Um, at the police department, uh, you know, when we put our uniforms on every day, we put this badge on, we put our citizens first, and the safety of our citizens first. We always uh, hope and, and work to exceed expectations of our citizens, and I believe this budget will put us in a position to do that. Mr. Kerman? Sir. One is the new school resource officer. Will you be deploying them to help you with these community outreach, or are they going to be completely dedicated to school, school operations and not be involved with training seniors on how to avoid scams? We, uh, the unique position of school resource officer, there's time, of course, you know, during the summer where, where there's downtime for the school, and that's where areas where, where I would look for them to also be involved in those programs and to, and to help coordinate those programs, but they would be throughout the years as well. The school would be the primary responsibility, 
the community outreach would be, you know, secondary responsibility, but they would also be very involved with all those programs. So I would like you to make it clear to the new hire sure. that that's what they'll be doing and to the union. Mm -hmm. So we don't have, it's not my job mentality that sometimes occurs. Yes, sir. So uh, you need to do what you need to do uh, in the community and it means uh, teaching some seniors about how to avoid a scam, I have to be willing to do that. Absolutely. It has to be someone with the demeanor mentality that wants to do other things. Outside, yeah. It's going to be hard. You know, you're going to have a challenge to find uh, a person who's flexible enough to do that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of questions by the officers about you know responsibilities and what's going to happen. But yeah, this uh, school resource officers uh, is going to have to wear a lot of different hats. Absolutely, and uh, they'll know that going in. All right, so the flexibility is there. That's good plan. Yes, sir. The next is uh, the difficulty of replacing automobiles. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing to increase their life? Training officers how to be easier on the vehicles. Doing different maintenance. I don't know what, but. Something you may not have the answers now, but I urge you to pursue something to extend the life of the vehicles. Yeah, and you know that's something that uh, the assistant chief and I have have done some research on. And you know, one of the difficult parts, and I saw this in my time at the University of Michigan. When I was at the Dearborn campus. Is when a vehicle idles. So when a when when an officer say is writing a police report in an idle vehicle. Um, that vehicle running at that idling speed is actually the same for that one hour um, is, it would, excuse me, for that period of time is like driving a vehicle 60 miles. So it's, um, there are some, some pieces of driving that patrol car that are, you know, uh, that, you know, they, they're just difficult to, you know, try to, um, because you would think, well, if a vehicle's sitting there idling, it's not, you know, cranking out miles, but in all actuality, by it sitting there, it's, a, it's actually adding 60 miles to the, to the wear and tear of the vehicle. Right. Now, driving, um, you know, and this is something that we continually monitor as part of our officers look at our um, officers driving their vehicles, not only out on the streets, but, you know, we have um, the in-car cameras and they look at those um, every month, you know, so they look at how they're driving the vehicles, uh, how they're responding to particular runs. Um, you know, things like that. So th that's something that's continually monitored. But uh, yeah, uh, the wear and tear is something that, um, you know, we are definitely going to uh, you know, stay on top of. Okay. Ginger? Uh, no, John, go ahead. Um, okay. Societal problems. What are you doing for training to help your officers with an increase in mental health and addiction. Let me finish. I received a phone call and I had a half hour conversation this afternoon. She's asked me to serve on a state bar committee with Cynthia Bullington, Deputy Administrator of the Attorney Grievance Commission. She was talking to me about it's worse than ever. The lack of reality. People in the public, and I'm not talking about election fraud, I'm talking about they have no reality. Maybe it's an example that we all know of who are working in general private law practices. I only had two beers. But the calibrated preliminary breath test says you blew a point two two. There's no reality there with that driver. Secondly, Addiction and alcohol is continuing to grow. And the city had a good discussion at their city commission meeting on Monday night about lifting the cap on more bars in the city of Plymouth. But Cynthia Bullington told me I may go public. Almost 20% of all practicing attorneys hit a rough patch with that mental illness the lack of grasp of reality and addiction to alcohol. So you're okay. So that's got to be prevalent out there in society too. And in the nature of the kind of problems you're dealing with, when you arrest somebody or when you 
stop somebody. Uh, not everybody is as solid and stable as uh, Kudra and Nitel. So what training are you doing and what are we doing to help educate our public? And we've got, we got some growing problems. And I talked to Cynthia Bullington for a half an hour this afternoon, the Deputy State of Michigan uh, Administrator for the Attorney Grievance Commission. Yeah, the, um, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we have, our officers are, are dealing with folks, uh, you know, with uh, mental illness, with addiction. Um, unfortunately, that, those are the folks that we come across a lot, um, you know, from day in and day out. And, uh, you know, we will continue uh, to provide training to our officers. Uh, that's something that we do, you know, annually, um, you know, with training. Uh, we also work very closely with, uh, you know, Pat's team at the fire department because many times, you know, these folks have to be transported, you know, to the hospital to get the care that they need, you know, so we work very closely with them. But, uh, yeah, we're continually making steps to, uh, to do that. And I know that the, the court system, I've met with uh, Judge Drew over at uh, the courthouse, and, uh, you know, the court is taking steps uh, with folks, you know, that come through with arrest and uh, when it's, it becomes addiction issues uh, and some mandates, some court, uh, you know, issue, you know, uh, court uh, mandated uh, treatments as well so i know that is in the works as well so yeah we, we do that in 35th district courts as so well. when we're on this uh, does the wayne county do you interface or have a contact with the wayne county health services when you have a situation that says that hey, this person needs care uh versus using the jail uh, i've heard that county jails are becoming mental institutions throughout the united states and we want to avoid that uh, by making the connection with mental health services or something. Yes. So uh, one of the things that we're doing in this area is, is quite honestly, I want to avoid dealing with Wayne County if at all possible. Uh, we have partnered with uh, GrowthWorks, which is, uh, they have offices in the city of Plymouth, and we have a program in place where if we have somebody in lockup and they, uh, you know, maybe they've, uh, you know, whatever, stolen something, um, you know, we have them for possession of some controlled substance or something like that. Uh, if they express to us that, hey, you know, I have a problem and, and I would like help, uh, GrowthWorks actually sends counselors uh, out here and they will meet with this individual at our facility and uh, they assign them a coach who sees them and, it, and it's, you know, I want to be very clear, it's not a uh, you know, the hugs, not handcuffs kind of a thing. They're still going to be held accountable for whatever crime it is that they have committed, but their counselor will help them through the court process and will follow up with them. And as long as they are willing and able to participate in the program, uh, they've had pretty good success with this program through GrowthWorks. Uh, additionally, on the training front, uh, one of the great benefits of the accreditation program that we're going through and that hopefully we will be awarded tomorrow is that it mandates uh, all kinds of training to include dealing with people uh, with mental illness. Uh, there's uh, autism training uh, that is uh, a part of that. Uh, you know, de-escalation. Uh, also, just uh, wellness for our, our staff, uh, which, you know, I mean, I've been here for 22 years, and it's not something that we've been very good about, if I'm being completely honest with you. And, uh, you know, it's important uh, because, you know, we see things that most people don't see, don't want to see, uh, and, and wouldn't be able to handle, and, and, you know, sometimes it's hard for us too. So uh, these are all training programs uh, that are uh, – we, we've been, I don't want to say forced to, but, but as part of this accreditation progress uh, program, we have uh, had to look at and had to implement, and uh, it's been very beneficial. And uh, the training that we have is, is, is pretty extensive. And anytime you want to come over and uh, sit down and join me in my office, I'll be more than happy to go through all the training that we do go through with you. Thank you. Okay. We're putting it on record. So the training budget, we didn't discuss it in detail, so... You've had to up the training budget substantially year over year because of this accreditation requirement of training. Yeah. And while you're looking that up, GrowthWorks will do services for adults also. I didn't know that. I thought it was only Yep. Yeah, young Gro people. GrowthWorks actually provides us all of our Narcan uh, at no charge, and they provide at no charge training to our officers for how to administer it. Good. So uh, they're, they're a very good partner for us. Uh, as far as the training budget goes, we did up it. Um, 
for uh, 2023 as compared to the 2022 uh, amended. Uh, we went from 29,200 in the amended uh, to 35,000. And if you go back to 2021 activity, uh, it was actually 34,700 in 2021. And in 2022, you know, we were still kind of on the tail end of COVID and a lot of the training, you know, the classes were getting canceled because people weren't, agencies weren't sending people and so they couldn't fill the class and then those got canceled and a lot of it went to Zoom. Uh, but we anticipate in 2023 that there's gonna be more in-person training. So we're, we're really just bringing that budget back to where it was, if that answers your question. All right. Okay, um, yeah, so are we done now with the police presentation? Sure. Ginger, how, what's your time frame? I mean, I, I know we still have a lot of slides. Uh, pardon me? Uh, if we could be patient and get through it, I guess it will depend on how many questions there are. Yeah. Um, I can say right now, that I think we'll do good and our percentage will be cost a year for these demonstrations. I talked to you about general public safety budget as a whole. Okay, is your mic on right now? Is your mic on? Is your mic on? Make sure. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Is the red light on? My red light is on. Okay. Red usually means stop, not go. Okay. I just, um, I'm just wondering out loud if we want to defer this to the next meeting, but I know we're going to have more budget stuff at the next meeting as well. And the next meeting is going to be, if it, it's going to be just as long as tonight. So well, hopefully you can get through okay, this in about so 10 let's, minutes. Let's roll. You want to adjourn or okay. No, no, I want it. We got to keep going. Then our next meeting is going to be busier than this one. Uh, we're way advanced on the slides. We need to go back to page one. I know. I was just saying there's a lot of detail in here, which is very valuable, but I'm, I'm getting I mean, and we tired. also have to assume colleagues that we've looked at this right. to some extent, you know, yeah, I, I don't, hope we don't everybody need had to, a chance to look it over. We don't need to go today. through every single number. All I've heard is there's been a lot of hard work, and maybe we should accept the recommendation. Uh, uh, well, let's go through no, it. But let's, That's our let's, job, though. So let's, this let's, is our job. Let's go. Okay. Let's get done in 20 minutes. So the fiscal year 2023 proposed general fund public safety budget request is $12,270,900. This is 60, roughly 63.5% of the general fund budget request. This is made up of $5,352,800 requested for the police department operation, $1,648,300 of funding used requested for the dispatch and jail function, and $5,269,800 requested budget for the fire and emergency management departments. The request of $12.3 million excludes the additional public safety expenditures needed for capital outlay and facility improvements proposed within the Township Revolving Fund, the American Rescue Act Plan, and or from any of the one of the three drug law funds. We're moving forward on slides? Or Next no? slide. No, you know. Okay, here we go. The 2002 millage rate was subject to a permanent Headley rollback, reducing the collective public safety tax rates from 4.3414 mills in 2021 to 4.3238 mills for 2022. The 2003 proposed revenue budget for property tax collection is based on the 2002 adopted millage rate and the taxable value of all properties on December 31st of 2021. The 2022 inflationary rate this year is 3.3%. Next year's property tax revenue will be collected this year on the winter tax roll between December of 2022 and February of 2023. The four combined adopted public safety villages are expected to generate approximately $8,971,500 in property tax revenues for 2023. This is made up of the police and fire one millage voted in 2015 which generate roughly 37% or 3.3 million of these total revenue dollars. Police fire millage number two rate was also passed in 2015. It is projected to deliver about 1.1 million or 13% of the total safety millage revenue. In 2018, voters approved the third police and fire millage, which should generate close to 2.4 million 
or 27% of the expected tax collection. The fire millage, which was reviewed in 2020, is anticipated to contribute just over $2 billion, or 23% of the total $8.9 million in expected public safety fund funding sources. Next slide. The requested by budget graph presents the 2019 to 2024 police, dispatch and jail, fire and emergency management department's annual general fund expenditures. The public safety's proposed use of general fund budget next year is just under 12.3 million, with the police department representing 44% of the general fund request the fire and emergency management functions accounting for 43%, and the dispatch utilizing, dispatch and jail utilizing 13% of the total proposed budget. The 2023 public safety funding use includes $188,800 of one-time OPEP contribution, a $25,000 general transfer to the Township Revolving Fund for future capital and facility needs, at $121,800 in debt service payments for a 2019 ladder truck and the 2020 dispatch equature communication system. On average from 2019 to 2024, the police department operation makes up approximately 45% of the public safety's general fund cost. The fire function requires 42%, and the dispatch and jail departments use approximately 30% of the overall general fund budget each year. Next slide. So from 21 to 24, the budget would increase by $1.3 million for public safety is what you're saying. Well, in 2019, you'll see that the, the actual expenditures were actually higher than in 2020. And that was related oh, yeah. to what type capital outlay that year? which why, I will why, get into on again. another slide. We, we had capital outlay, we bought a fire truck, we had ambulance, Jaws of Life, uh, Viper uh, workstation in the 911 and um, communication system. So there's a number of items you'll see that it actually fluctuates year over year. Yeah, I, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, we can follow, you don't have to answer the question right now and follow up, but I'm curious to see if you carve this out in people costs versus capital costs, what that looks like, are we seeing um, a 10% increase in people costs year over year, or is this because uh, of capital? Purchases? Again, I didn't add up the retirement, the insurances, yeah. and the wages, but you can see the budget categories when we get to the next slides for each of the departments. Okay. Oh, I can see. The four public safety millages are expected to generate just over 8.9 million in 2023 of the needed 12.3 million in general fund dollars to cover the public safety operation. From 2019 to 2024, the extra voted public safety millage trend line demonstrates that these revenues on average provide for approximately 69% of the total public safety's annual general fund request. So how do you, how do you calculate the revenue from the millage? What is your assumption? Did you assume the taxable value went up by 5% or you did something else? So for 2023, we know what the adopted millage rate is. And for 2023, we know what the taxable value is that was set by the assessor on December 31st to 21 that went out on the 22 assessment notices. So the revenue that I indicated in the first slide, we will collect on the winter tax roll this year between December of 22 and February of 23. So we already know what the set millage rate is and we already know what the set taxable value is. It's in the approximate amount because we're still pending possible order changes that may come in from the tax tribunals, the December border review, the state tax commission, so are other things that could affect taxable value to bring the actual dollars down. So that's why we say this is the, the estimated or the proposed revenue. So the taxable value in this case went up by 3.2%. The taxable value increase for 2022 was 33 But it could go the other way. 
I mean, te they can go, the values can go down too. Not I've seen that before. Right now, we're using the border review, March 2022 border review. Right. And the tribunal, you know, any adjustments are not going to be that significant that are going to yeah, really move like the have, needle that much. It's not like we have some massive, no. you know, manufacturing plant like you know the city of Wayne or Dearborn right. or something. That's in Court or in something. Woodhaven. You know. Yeah. Okay. In 2023, the public safety millage is expected to provide just over 73% of the total general fund dollars being requested. The increase in the percentage of support from the public safety millage in 23 for these functions is due to a temporary reduction in the lower pension and health care costs. The average percentage change for these functions vary on an annual basis as a result of the operation's annual capital needs and the annual inflationary rate of goods and services. Next slide. The police department's total general fund request in 2023 is 5.3 million, making up 44% of the proposed 12.3 million in general fund budget. The general fund support is comprised of 3.2 million in wages or 61% of the function's total request, as the general fund will also provide for 1.2 million in retirement benefits, which make up almost 22% of the department's proposed budget, while insurance benefits and general office operations make up the remaining request of 889,000. Retirement benefits include the required pension contribution of $687,000, the retiree health care premiums and OPEB contribution of $292,000, as well as the financing commitment to the 401A retirement plan of $186,000 for employees hired after the defined, bench, defined benefit plan was closed. Um, it varied from 2014 up to 2020, depending on which uh, function we're talking about. I don't remember the dates off the top of my head. I do have the actual report. But again, why did we see such a sharp increase uh, over over that that uh, five year period? We see we see a 1.3 million dollar increase, which is one which is about 20 percent compounded growth. That's the case. That's a multiple of inflation. Yes. So why in 2024 do we see that sharp increase from 2023? Uh, well, for example, in 2024, dollars. capital outlay needs are actually have actually been put into the general fund request okay. rather than being made from the drug law funds at this point uh, because of the amount of remaining fund balance that, that we're anticipating at the end of 23. Okay, so that that's prudent to do that. Well, um, we, we wouldn't have other funding sources available, so capital needs would have to come from the general fund sources. Okay. Or you, cut. You, or you cut. Or you cut. would but make you can, a, a priority list. Right. But I think what you're saying is that we can't assume that we're going to have an, uh, an inflow of, uh, of drug forfeiture money, so these capital, capital purchases in 24 have to be at least at this point, projected to hit the general um, general fund. Okay. The 23 proposed budget does not include any capital outlay for aging equipment or facilities. Next year's capital outlay need of 313,600 is being requested from the remaining drug law funds. The 2024 forecasted budget includes $214,700 in capital needs to replace three patrol cars and the police department's computer server and data switches. What was the last item? Data switches. The, da the computer network and the data switches, which was talked about during the police department's network presentation equipment. as a future need. Next slide, please, Bob. The dispatch and jail function require a use of 13% of the general fund's portion of the proposed budget of $12.3 million. The general fund revenue source will provide for $1.6 million requested, 
by supporting just over $1 million in salaries, making up 63% of the function's requested budget in 2023. Retirement benefits of $211,000 are made up of $132,000 contribution to pension, $10,000 in pay-as-you-go retiree health care premiums and the one-time OPEB obligation, in addition to the annual defined contribution retirement payment of almost $69,000. In fiscal year 2019, a one-time capital outlay expenditure for aged equipment in the dispatch center provided for a new 911 Viper workstation and communication system totaling 311,000. The equipment was partially supported by a Michigan Strategic Fund grant that delivered $200,000 in funding towards that purchase. The department's operation is partially supported by financial assistance, which is received from the Conference of Western Wayne and the City of Plymouth. Funding How much is from their the state of Michigan. Anticipated in 2023. I'm sorry. How much is the City of Plymouth's contribution to dispatch and jail? I'll get to that on another slide. All right. Funding from the state of Michigan for 911 local sur surcharges are passed through the Conference of Western Wayne based on population, while the City of Plymouth's revenues are projected based on their expected use of the dispatch and jail operation. Next slide. The Fire Department's $5.3 million request use of next year's general fund resources represents 43% of the overall proposed safety budget. This includes funding for the emergency management function and the one-time general fund transfer of $25,000 to the Township's revolving fund for future capital outlay and facility needs. The general fund will support a request of $2.9 million in wages for next year, which makes up approximately 55% of the function's request. The proposed budget consists of $1.2 million, or 22%, of the request for retirement benefits. These benefits comprise of a $500,000 in retiree health care premiums and the one-type OPEB payment, a commitment of $174,000 to the DC retirement plan, and $621,000 in, re in required pension contributions. In 19, expenditures included a one-time capital purchase for a pumper truck and a Tomahawk ambulance with equipment. The ambulance purchase price was $203,000. It was partially supported by the Michigan Strategic Fund grant that provided $200,000 for this purchase. <coughs> Next slide. Over the last four years, between 2019 and 2022, the township will have contributed just over $10.7 million in public safety retirement benefits. Retirement benefits include retiree health care, defined contribution retirement plan, and pension benefits, which reflect a use in the general fund resources <coughs> of just over $2.5 million for 2023. This makes up approximately 21% of the public safety's general fund proposed budget for next year. The 23 budget request comprises of $677,000 to retiree health care, $1.4 million to the retirement of pension obligations, and $429,000 to DC retirement plan. Pension benefits for 2023 are based on the actuarial report ending in fiscal year 2021. The report reflected a favorable market performance last year. This resulted in an improvement to the plan's rate of return and a reduction in our annual contribution for the 23 proposed budget. While interest rates remain elevated, it is anticipated that stocks will continue to face volatile environments in the coming months. Pension contributions are expected to increase in 2024. The financial commitment will be based on the actuary's 2022 year-end report with future payments dependent on the investment market performance throughout the rest of this year. At this time, the required 2024 contribution is expected to return or possibly exceed the 2022's projected budget. 
Retiree health care proposed budget reflects the reduction in health care premiums, reflecting a positive effect in the first three quarters of 2023 as a result of better-than-expected costs realized by the medical industry in 2021. However, current market indicators for health care are trending upward and are expected to impact premiums again in 2024. Next slide. Just to clarify something, um, the, the, in one of, uh, one of your documents, the, you talked about um, healthcare costs based on experience, but that is not, our costs are not based on the usage in our small group. It's based across- it's based on the medical industry's um, across experience. The board. Right, okay. Of the public safety's 2023 total general fund request of just under 12.3 million, 59% or $7.2 million will go to wages. 2.5 million will be utilized for retirement benefits, and 1.1 million will be used for general, pu general public safety operations. The public safety millage rates are expected to generate $8.9 million in revenue and provide for just over 73% of the need of funding to support the three major functions of the entire operation. The police and fire millage one will, will, is expected to generate $3.3 million in funding and provide for 27.2% of the requested general fund proposed budget of $12.3 million. Passed in 2015, police and fire millage number two should provide approximately $1.2 million and cover about 9.4% of the operational need. Police and fire millage rate number three, passed in 2018, is anticipated to produce $2.4 million, generating 20% of the amount obligated to the public safety function in 2023. And the fire millage renewed in 2020 is likely to deliver near, nearly $2 million of the total requested proposed general fund budget. Next slide. Uh, so, before you go away, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not tying the chart to the, um, the graph or the, the uh, table to the pie chart. Okay, so for example, wages make up $7.2 million and, and require 59% of the general fund. On the chart, you see that the voted millages in 2015 through 2022 are across the top. And across the bottom, the total amount of the revenue equally to 8.9 million is what the total public safety millages will generate in revenue sources. As you start at the top, the wages are 59% of the use, and it coincides back with the pie chart. What this graph is telling you that in 2015, police and fire millage number one will cover 1.9 million of that $7.2 million needed. Okay. As you work your way across, all four of those millages will cover 5.2 million so or the, almost 5.3 million the table of the 7.2. Yeah, based on the proportion, uh, it's allocating the millage basically. Correct, so how much of each of those millages cover each of those budget categories? Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Now I follow. Okay, the city of Plymouth contribution is how much? So let's get to the next slide. I beg your pardon, we're talking, it's on there, right there, COP. Yeah, I, I mentioned it on there as part of the, that the, the city of Plymouth at the Conference of Western Way will provide 678,800. On the next slide, I actually tell you the breakdown. Sorry. The 2019 to 2024 chart reflects all funding sources utilized to support the public safety operation with the general, from the general fund. The chart does not reflect additional funding sources like drug law, ARPAT funds, or township revolving funds that also support these functions. In addition to the $8.9 million in extra vote of public safety, the general fund reserve will provide for $2.4 million in support of the public safety. Other funding sources of 875,000 is made up of several revenue providers. 
Financing is generated from the City of Plymouth, the Conference of Western Way for 911 services, and ambulatory transportation revenue. The City of Plymouth's proposed 2023 cost share is projected at 524000 for next year, while the Conference of Western Way 911 revenue is anticipated to generate 155000 reflecting a total of 679000 in support of the dispatch and jail operation. The budget revenue from the City of Plymouth has been based on its historical average cost share of 32% of the dispatch and jail department's annual expenditures. Okay, may I talk now and ask the question? Sure. All right, the City of Plymouth, who has reviewed the budget with the City of Plymouth and obtained their sign off that they have reviewed it? Uh, we don't normally get a sign off. There's usually just a communication set that lets them know what the proposed budget is um, so that they know. I you know last year John Brothers communicated with the chief over there, uh, sent the information. Okay, I want um, something more definitive that they, they saw it and looked at it. They I don't received, think that they there's anything. That they had it. I don't think there's anything in the IGA that requires a signature on their part that, that they're approving the budget. That this board approves the budget and their know, cost share is based on their use. It's just good business practice in the past. As a courtesy, we, we send it to the finance director and the, I believe it's the police chief over there. In the past, we had some problems that the city of Plymouth felt they hadn't seen it or hadn't been totally disclosed. Okay. So I think a little error on the side of over communication and let's talk to them, please, and, and get some, not just dump it over the wall. Uh, it's just a courtesy. There are, they are a customer. Exactly. I agree. And we want to treat them like that. So over the last few years, while I've been here as a courtesy, we've made sure that we provided them with a copy of the budget and as well as indicating the date of the, the meeting that the board would, will be held. And as, as last year, you know, no one showed up to the meeting to dispute or to provide any feedback. That's okay, that's okay. But they, I'd, I'd be talking, I'd be sending them this draft budget now in yeah. case they have a question. Yeah, and I, can, I have regular meetings with uh, Chief Cox, so I can uh, add this as an agenda item and uh, we can discuss that for sure. And their finance person probably needs to be aware. Can we give it to John. John Bullis? Uh, Scanlon. John Scanlon is their finance director. Okay, so ready for the next slide, Bob. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long you're day. Hold, you're holding us up, man. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm clicking as fast as I can. Get off my back. <laughs> George Jetson. In addition to the general funds proposed budget supporting the public safety operation, an additional use of 650000 59,000 is requested for equipment and facility needs. These requested expenditures have been budgeted in other funding sources to fully provide for all funding needs to these operation functions. The total public safety proposed request for 2023 is $12,929,500. While the extra voted public safety village supports 73% of the general fund budget request, it supports just a little over 69% of the total need to operate the public safety function in 2023. Next slide. So in other words, 70, the millage covers 70% and the rest of the, the other 30% comes out of uh, other sources. In other words, in, in short. 73% well, is what it's expected to cover for 2023. But if you include the other funding sources, that reduces almost um, just about 3.5% to 69.4%. Okay. The police department's request for 2023 includes the use of 314000 from other sources outside the general fund, as this request is supported by the remaining fund balances available within the three drug law enforcement funds. Like grant awards, the drug law revenues are only realized when received. The collection of additional revenue from these sources all vary based on the timing of litigation and the final settlement of pending cases. Unless additional revenues are realized this year, the expected fund balance remaining in these three funds will be approximately 412000 
in support of next year's request, a requested use of 314,000. This year's fund balance estimate already includes the 117,000 that has been collected as of today's date. Next slide. From 2019 to 2023, the drug law funds will have provided almost $1.2 million in funding to the police department for facility and equipment needs that were not supported by the general fund revenue sources. The general fund, rev the general fund reserves transferred to the Township Revolving Fund from 2019 to 2023 has been 150000 and will have provided for $23,900 in facility repair needs at the three township fire stations in 2020 and 2021, with an additional request for use of 20,000 in 2023 at fire station number one. Between 2019 to 2023, all funding sources outside of the general fund have provided for just over $1.5 million in resources to support the public safety operation equipment and facility needs. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, that's all folks. All right, any questions for Ginger at this time? She is always available, she's always here. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, email her or stop by. So the narrative you just gave us, uh, you're reading that. Can you send that to us? You mean my notes? Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, those are notes. So you didn't, they're not. Uh... All right. Yeah. Well. It wasn't a script. For you. For you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I uh, prepared notes uh, so that I could speak to each slide. I don't want to read the yeah. slide to you exactly so what's all on the these, slide. These slides are on our email right now. Or they all of will those. Be? Do, yeah, okay. those are all well, part I know, of the, it's very the, the printing doesn't come through with the detail in, in the printing. Um, I could send out a new PDF, sure. the, the original PDF. PDF of the entire packet with all the PowerPoint presentations, if you'd like me to do that. Oh. Yes, please. Ginger, another nice job. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Okay, Ginger, thank you very much, and I know we'll see you at our next meeting as well. Um, at this point, Carol, uh, there's you too, Carol. Carol, thanks uh, uh, as well. Um, there's nobody here from the public left. Uh, everybody's in bed, so what we're going to do is, uh, <laughs> if there's anybody on the board who wants to comment, go for it right now. Otherwise, we'll adjourn. Thank you very much, and good night. I was just say this. Yes, one go ahead. The, one of the benefits of I can <laughs> There you go. There you go. Okay, move for the uh, adjournment. Okay, motion has been made by Clerk Vorbit to adjourn. Is there a second? Second by Trustee Monahan. All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, aye. we're adjourned. <laughs>